Throughout cinema history, some of the best alien movies have shone a light on the monstrous, destructive nature of human beings. In 2007, Frank Darabont adapted a novella by Stephen King about Lovecraftian creatures invading a small town, but the film seemed equally concerned with giving us a gut-wrenching and unflinching portrayal of how human beings turn on each other in crisis. <laughs> Meanwhile, in 2018, director Alex Garland adapted a novel by Jeff Vandermeer about mutant alien creatures, but arguably it's a film more concerned with directly addressing grief, depression, and the human propensity for self-destruction. Annihilation. Join me as we continue exploring the evolution of alien horror, and we discuss Frank Darabont's The Mist and Alex Garland's Annihilation. Welcome back to the evolution of horror. My name is Mike Munter, and as ever, I am your host. If you're tuning in for the first time, then welcome. In this podcast, we explore and dissect the history and the evolution of the horror genre by looking at particular subgenres one series at a time. We are currently in the middle of our seventh series exploring the evolution of alien, sci fi, and cosmic horror, and this is part 24. This week's episode is sponsored by $20 Patreon subscribers Harpy Productions. And in this week's episode, as that intro suggested, we're really going heavy on the cosmic and sci-fi angles to uh, give you a double bill of... Uh, real feel bad movies uh, The Mist from 2007 and Annihilation from 2018 it's a heavy going double bill but my god these are incredible films we will be discussing them in spoilerific detail please 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 if you haven't seen them do yourself a favour and check both these movies out before listening to our discussions so later on in the episode I'm going to be joined by the brilliant Layla Latif to discuss Annihilation in depth. But first of all, it's time to discuss Frank Darabont's The Mist. I sat down with friend of the pod, Louise Blaine, to discuss one of the most upsetting, harrowing, and brilliant alien movies ever made. Enjoy. Hello, Louise. Hello, Mike. How are you? I'm good. I'm good. You know, it's like, it's getting, it's like one of those days here. I don't know what it's like in Glasgow, but it's like really nice autumnal, crisp, cold, blue sky sort of autumn evening. And it's just, I love this time of year. Do you know, it has been like that in Glasgow, mm. but not today. <laughs> the past couple okay. of days, <laughs> yes, it's been, I think you've now probably got what we had yesterday, which was yes, lovely. Yes, we had, we had rubbish yesterday. Oh, so, okay. Yeah, so I had, I right. had lovely, delightful blue skies, crispy underfoot, loving mm-hmm. the orange leaves, just looks like some kind of catalogue image. Yes, mm. but not today. Today is grey and occasionally the rain has been hitting my window, which is why I ordered in Nando's for my lunch. Oh, the dream. The dream. The dream. Um, I don't know about you, but I there's something... I was talking about this with Stevie and Becky earlier on in the week on Patreon. We were talking about kind of comfort horror films. Mm. And there's something I think very comforting about Stephen King horror, right? Like settling in on the sofa under a blanket at this time of year and watching something like The Mist or anything Stephen King... There's something very warm and comforting about it, you know? There is something warm and comforting about Stephen King, but I don't think there's anything warm and comforting about watching The Mist. I do think (laughs) that of all of Stephen King's work, and even in Stephen King's version, and we'll go into it, but I do not think... I will. I think (laughs) The Shining is much more comforting to me Uh than uh The Mist. Um, Even, you know, something like The Green Mile is obviously heartbreaking and by Frank Darabont. Mm -hmm. But they're they're genuine. It usually is something very cosy about Stephen King because he has this, like, delightful Americana, which is usually circled around being a kid. So he talks, and there's some bits Mm. in The Mist where, in the novella, where he talks about, like, the sound of a teacher quietly marking papers and a baseball team being picked out in the park. So there's something very youthful and small-towny about Stephen King, which is delightful. But The Mist isn't it for me (laughs) yeah i know what you mean and we'll get into this of course the film is devastating and terrifying in many ways there's also something that that 
it, it manages to balance a kind of warmth as well as being incredibly mean spirited. The humans, I think, the mist. Yeah. Yes, there's something the humans very human in it about are good. it. Yeah, exactly. Uh, so let's get into it, shall we? Let's talk about the mist from 2007. Now, listen, everybody, we are experiencing some kind of disaster. No, it's the end of days. Oh my God! Something in the mist. Shut the doors. Shut the doors. I don't know whether it's man-made or natural, but I do know that it's definitely not supernatural. It is time to take sides. The saved and the damned. Read the good book. It calls for blood. Think something got in? Guys, I hear something. Don't you know the truth? We are! Well, the setup of the mist is absolutely delightfully simple in the fact mm-hmm. that after a storm which brings down lots of trees, uh, a man and his son and his takes his grumpy lawyer neighbour along with him go to the supermarket to pick up some supplies and the rest of the small town, which is in Maine and I think it's Castle Rock because Castle Rock is one of Stephen King's many places. Um, yes. They're all in there, everyone's buying things, the power's out, they're all queuing and all of a sudden there's an earthquake and mm. then there's something in the mist and they don't leave again (laughs) they do not um so what do you think of the mist louise i i absolutely adore the mist the mist to me Mm -hmm. and you know it was funny i was i was reading after i watched and some people are very sniffy about the Mm -hmm. mist it seems i actually think it's a real masterpiece um i think it's i think it's a real masterpiece i think what you were talking about before about having that warmth and having those humans I think it does a perfect job of introducing you to everyone in that wonderful way that I think Stephen King does, which is drop you into a world that's already in existence and everyone's mm-hmm. already been chatting. Like there's even tiny moments like um, he says to the girl that's on the checkout and says, oh, can you babysit such and such, uh, babysit him again, uh, Bill again? Yeah. And she's like, oh, yeah, yeah, I've got that covered. And suddenly you know that you're part of a world where she regularly babysits his kid and everyone mm-hmm. knows one another in like... In, in one line. It's just this yeah. effortless way that you realise that they're all connected. An existing world that you just dropped into, right? It really does give you that feeling. Yeah, yeah I completely agree with you. I think this is a masterpiece. I think it's a perfect movie. Yeah. Like, perfect. It is one of the most upsetting and, like I said earlier, like, mean-spirited films. It's vindictive. <laughs> I've ever watched, right? Uh, but I love it. Yep. I love it. And it, it is upsetting, but my God, it really makes me... We were texting each other when we both watched it. It really makes me feel something. Like, it doesn't yep. just scare me. It 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 really kind of upsets me. Yes, it <laughs> but, is upsetting. But I kind of love it for that at the same time, you know? Um, and 2007 was such a strange time. Like, it, it almost doesn't... There's something timeless about this film, I think, as well. Like, if you think this this came out around the same time as things like Paranormal Activity or Saw or Hostel or whatever else, it doesn't feel like it belongs of that era almost, does it, this no. film? It's, I think that's a King thing. I think there's yeah. a King timelessness to all of that. His stuff, I mean, it it is mental to me that he's got, you've got books of his from 70s and 80s. Yeah. Like there's literally books of his the way you're like all of his references and all of his music references and everything they are really old. Mm. But those 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 books do not feel old. Those yeah. don't feel like old texts. You can just pick them up and they feel as current as they were and it doesn't matter that they're going to a payphone to try and make it work and not a smartphone. You know, yeah. in fact, what Stephen King did with smartphones in the shape of cell was dreadful. <laughs> so oh, we just don't even talk about that. So, but the 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 timelessness of the mist it's just so accessible. And also, Darabont is such a safe pair of hands for Amazing. all of King's stuff. Absolutely incredible, right? So that that is, again, I think, what lends this that human heart. I think this is like Frank Darabont and now Mike Flanagan. These are two filmmakers that are incredibly good at that King tone, aren't they? Uh, obviously, like you mentioned, he had already at this point directed The Green Mile. He obviously, is hugely successful. And before that, The Shawshank Redemption. I mean, Just Shawshank. W- widely considered by many people the greatest movie ever made, right? It yeah. like rivals Citizen Kane in that kind of uh, poll often. Um, so, you know, 
he he does it well, doesn't he? He pulls yes. off King, and, and this is the first time he's done King horror in a way, because before this he's done that kind of slightly more sentimental drama stuff. But yeah. my God, he's good at it. And also, <laughs> so I good. think the horror of The Mist is just so horrific. You yes. know, and actually I didn't realise, I reread the novella um, after I watched the other night. I actually, I reread the novella because it's just, um, it's actually quite a short story. It's not a short story, but a novella is almost, you know, it, it's really not that long. And I read it and it's part of the book Skeleton Crew. And what really struck me this time, because I'd never watched the film and read the book in such, in, in such a short space of time. Yeah. There is so much of his script lifted directly, absolutely di- directly. Any memorable things that you can think of that anyone said is because Stephen King wrote it. And I think there's that really important thing where Darabont, I think he, I was, I was reading and he sort of looked after this in his head for like 20 years of what he wanted to make of this movie. And he, he really lifted so much of it. It's very, it's very close to what oh. King wrote. Very, very close. I think you can really feel that, can't you? Like like we said, it there's a timeless quality to it. There's a there's a warmth to it. And there is this it does feel like it's coming straight from the mouth of King when you watch yep. it almost, doesn't yep. it? So that that makes a lot of sense. Um and we'll talk about this as we go, I'm sure. But other than that, does it stay fairly faithful, sort of story wise, to the original it, holy, novella? Holy. Yeah. I mean, mm-hmm. there's a couple of um <laughs> there's a weird bit where uh, Thomas Jane's character and Laurie Holden sneak off to an office in Stephen King's book, and that's just be- that's just very King. That's yeah. almost like very schlocky horror. It's like oh, there's not been any sex. Yeah, and literally, it's really a bit sh- of sex. Yeah. It, it's not lewd in any way. It's kind of it's almost like a scene where he's just trying to connect, and he's thinking about his wife the whole time, and mm. she says someone else's name. So it's really like, so Darabont wow. clearly just went, no, we want him to be through and through a family man. Because yeah. I think you could almost relate to it in the book and say, I see what you're doing here. You just want to feel close with someone. Mm-hmm. And actually in the movie, I don't think that would come across that way because you don't know the internal purpose mm-hmm. of that character. So you'd just be like, well, you're a dick. You've, you've been away from your wife for two day, for a day yes. in, in a shopping centre of tentacles, uh, a shopping a supermarket of tentacles, and you've decided to have a quick fuck upstairs yeah. in the office. So that's not necessary. Yeah, <laughs> But that- yeah, that's the only real, that's the only real difference. I love really. it. Other than the ending, obviously. And the ending, indeed. Mm. Because again, Stephen King is known for his not great ending sometimes, right? Uh, a lot of the time. And sometimes he does dip into schmaltzy endings and that kind of thing. And no one could accuse this film of having a, a schmaltzy, happy ending. <laughs> yeah. Well, the thing is, the novella ends... And it, he Frank Darabont says he took a natural conclusion because actually there is a point where um, Stephen King... There was actually only four of them that ended up getting in the car at the end of the novella. Uh-huh. And he said the words, I only had three bullets and there's only four there's four of us but i'd work something out Mm. so that line is there and also Mm -hmm. like he's writing all this stuff the reason that we're actually reading what happened in the mist is because he's written it all down on stationery at some service station somewhere and he's kind of saying like i don't know what we're going to find i'm just going to leave this here in case you find it so they're still not hope but they are alive that makes a lot of sense but darabont has said that stephen king like basically said i wish i'd done your ending and totally signed it off Totally signed off. Yeah. Stephen, which is ter- even more terrifying. <laughs> Stephen King himself apparently was really impressed with this film, with this yeah. adaptation. And as we know, vocal, like we've talked about The Shining together, as we know, he's very vocal about adaptations he doesn't like of his yes. work. Um, this is one he very much put his stamp of approval on. And maybe that's because, like you said, it's it, it stayed so close to the source it's, material. It's so close, down yeah. to even in that scene in the, in the office at the back, mm-hmm. where the tentacle grabs some dog food. Down to that scene, there is right. literally... There's everything is there. Darabont has just somehow yanked visuals out of this and down to the descriptions of the bugs as well. Because I think we've oh. not talked about how truly horrifying those creatures are. We've got like, so much to discuss. Yeah. And let me just, I just want to, before we get into some of the story beats, let me ask you about Frank Darabont and his direction generally. Do you think, how do you think this film looks? Obviously there was, originally he planned for it to be in black and white, right? Which, yeah. I mean, you can get that version. Sadly, the one that's widely available is the colour version, um, which isn't what he intended um, initially. But how do you think generally, he, uh, you know, did Frank Darabont do a good job of kind of bringing these visuals to life, do you think? Oh, totally. Because I actually think mm. the CG obviously it's 14 years old yeah i think the cg still looks pretty good because, and a lot of the things i swear they built like the spiders and the creatures and things yeah but i think from a direction point of view it's very intimate 
Um, mm. There's lots of sort of handheld shakiness. We're, we're very much there as part of it. We're not constantly held at a distance, which I feel like, you know, when everyone is sitting on the floor of an aisle of the supermarket or you're always constantly up close. But I do think, and I think it's sad, and I think you and I both said this, the black and white version is on the DVD mm-hmm. and I couldn't find my DVD and neither could you. No, <laughs> And I, I wish I had watched it in black and white because I think, I think the alien, the nasty creature cosmic horror of those things yes. should be in black and white which is the, the even the end sequence is, is shrouded in mist it's basically the closest it can get yes it almost does look black and white when you look outside into the mist doesn't it uh it does it's only when you're in the supermarket but yeah i think i think a lot of the effects look really great i think there are a couple of moments that look a bit clanky uh, the the tentacles <laughs> it's the tentacles isn't it which sadly is is sort of the first thing you see as well and that is that's is the stuff that doesn't hold up quite so much but yeah generally the rest of it when we get to the bugs and the spiders and the mm-hmm. other horrible things i think it looks amazing and you're right i love that handheld camera very different to how he directed Shawshank and Green Mile which is very kind of mannered very formal this is chaotic isn't it like deliberately so so many cast members this big ensemble people yelling at each other different things happening the camera's like swooshing around from person to person and it, it works so well doesn't it you're like holding your breath almost throughout all those scenes you know totally that and I think they there's some really interesting stuff with sound too so I mean you never it's there's so much silence like painful silence there's never any music to kind of break it up mm-hmm. even when you're out in the mist the mist has a noise it has like a sort of it has a strange echoing sound effect mm. that means that when you see characters in it you can almost feel how cold it is yes like i think there's um oh gosh i can't remember the actress's name played carol in the walking dead because obviously there's lots of walking dead but yes. she leaves and the door shuts behind her and she's suddenly in the mist and she kind of goes i'm, I'm about to do a bit of nev campbell acting here and she goes oh, and you can feel how cold the mist is. Yes. And, and there's this kind of echoing sound. And then it kind of, the, the music throughout of it is really interesting. It does a lot of stuff with vocals, which mm. is then quite unsettling because it's very human, but also unnatural. There's a whole lot of really interesting sound stuff too. Um, and there are so many cast members and characters I want to ask you about. Let's start at the beginning and let me ask you about our main characters here. Um, I suppose David, played by Thomas Shane, and his son. I mean, we see his wife in the opening scene and then basically we don't see her again right but what do you think of david as our kind of stephen king all-american hero man in the center of this he's such a typical stephen king character he yeah. really is he's a he's an illustrator and in it he's literally painting the dark tower <laughs> i know like, there's i love that and there's, there's a painting so of the thing in the background yes. as well isn't there uh, yeah. i think he's meant to be is it drew starzan what's his name is it drew starzan the artist Oh, is it? Mm-hmm. Yes. Yeah, because all of the, I think all of the art in that room is by Drew Starzan, I think. Oh, okay. So he is effectively Drew Starzan, but not. Mm-hmm. But I think he's, even in his tone and delivery, he's very much the Stephen King hero. Yeah. I mean, almost unnaturally so. Yes. Um, but but I find it quite endearing and I find the relationship with the little with his little boy really quite endearing as well like i think there's some and there's another stephen king reference because he calls him big bill and that's obviously bill from it there's just so many interwoven things that if you're a stephen king fan you just tick mentally all the way through um but yeah i really i thought it was really genuine and, and human and i quite liked him and i don't know where where did he go yeah, he Thomas Jane. Yeah, I don't know. That's a really good question. I was thinking that when I was watching. I was like, well, this guy, we don't really see him much anymore. Um, did he do I'm The just, Punisher? I'm just having a look now. Yes, he did do The Punisher. But that was uh, the movie rather than... Yes. Uh, mm. He's not done a whole lot. I mean, it looks like he's done maybe sort of smaller parts in, in, mm. in various films, but... I don't know how many sort of leading man roles he's had. Like, for example, he was in Scott Pilgrim vs. the World as vegan police officer. Uh, oh, and, you that know, makes me quite sad. I know, <laughs> like, I know. He's, but maybe he is, maybe he but kind of belongs to that sort of timeless kind mm. of face. He's almost maybe too he wholesome, maybe, yeah. or something. Yeah. He doesn't have an edge. Um, and I think, you know, especially some of the other really interesting, colourful characters in this ensemble that you meet in the supermarket, right? In some ways, he is... He's he's very heroic. He's very pure. He's almost boring. And vanilla, right? He's vanilla. Yeah, he's, v- he's vanilla is the perfect <laughs> word. He is very vanilla, isn't he? Compared yeah. to some of these others. Um, Poor David. We go to the supermarket and we meet our incredible cast of characters, and this is a, a, an amazing cast. Of course, anyone who's familiar with Frank Darabont's other work, mainly. Uh, the Walking Dead, right, will recognise so many of these cast members, which is really lovely. It almost feels like a little, 
a little back, well, like a pilot, family. Like, like yeah. a little undead it, family is sort of collecting them beforehand. Yeah, it's so sweet. I love it. Again, r- kind of reminds me a bit of Mike Flanagan and the way he reuses yeah. actors, right? As well, because there are some actors as well I recognise from the Shawshank Redemption and Green Mile as well. Like he does reuse a lot of the same people. Um, but what do you think of this big ensemble cast generally? Oh, I think I don't think I'd ever really appreciated the perfection of how you're introduced to all of them and how you're suddenly in their world Mm -hmm. and you understand them you understand every single one of them you understand miss carmody you understand uh little ollie weeks like you understand all of these characters in a really immediate interesting way Mm -hmm. and then I think it's very then then very interesting of how it's split by that air raid siren, which is genuinely the most stressful noise. Yes. And then that other actor that was also in the Green Mile shouting yes. something in the mist and just piling into there with the blood running from his nose. Mm-hmm. And it's just because then you get the reactions of all the characters as well. So suddenly you've been with them when they're normal. Yes. And you've seen them all you've seen the army guys arrive and then suddenly you are as like you're all together and you're all reacting and you're there immediately with them. Mm-hmm. And it just does that so effortlessly. And they're such an interesting lot as well. They are. It's it, And it becomes a little microcosm of humanity, doesn't it, in this, where you've got a religious war, you've got, you know, every, you know, every conceivable... It, it's like... It's like humanity in under a microscope across yeah. the space of a day, isn't it? In a in a supermarket, um, it's it's really clever. But yeah, I love. I believe all of them. I love all of them. Um, Laurie Holden. I'm a big fan oh of Laurie gosh. Holden. What's happened to her as well? Like there, there are some amazing people in this. You well, know? she was. How lo- we were talking about it, weren't we? How long was she in The Walking Dead for? Because we both stopped not long watching enough. it after she was gone. Yes, <laughs> yeah, exactly. Not long enough. She was one of the best people in The Walking Dead. I think they got rid of her after series three, which is when both me and That's you stopped, stopped watching it, isn't yeah. it? The, the the series with the governor. Um, yes. I, I really liked The Walking Dead at the beginning and for me it just went on and on and on. It was too much. But uh, she's really great. In, she was really great in The Walking Dead. She's really great yeah. in this as well, isn't she? She's a great you know? actress. Yeah. I think what is interesting about the characters as well is it gets a really... It gets across the kind of dissonance between the locals and the people who just come in there as a country, as their, you know, their city escape. Because yes. that's the that's the sort of uh, the pull back and forth between his neighbour and him, sort of Brent yes. Norton and him, is that idea of he's kind of the guy that shows up in his flashy convertible. And yes, it got smashed and oh no, that's very sad. But he's not been put, taking knocking down the tree. Mm. He's left that. You know, there's, there's these tensions of, well, you're the city folk that only come and use our use our town mm-hmm. and uh, yes you say you pay taxes but you don't really belong here and that's introduced from the get-go but suddenly mm. makes it more much more tribal once the door shut like you say when that siren goes off and we have a character run into the supermarket and say there's something in the mist and when shit starts hitting the fan and panic starts kicking in it's just like all guns blazing from that point yep. with all, all the way through to the end isn't it yeah, basically it's really nice. um do you find did it was anything added to you watching it now in 2021 in a sort of post covid world because I can't I can't help but think about that kind of stuff whenever I see some sort of apocalyptic scenario like this do you know what I mean So I think I mess I think I messaged you on Instagram saying we're going to end up talking about covid aren't yeah. we <laughs> It's I think there's two parts to that I think the first is the part that I didn't expect I think when I first saw that I would have thought that people would never have reacted in some of the ways that they did I would have thought yes. oh that's not realistic because real people don't think like that and they don't come up with these irrational thoughts and that mm-hmm. doesn't happen and all of a sudden you know we've just had 18 months we've not just had COVID where people deny science we have also had uh, QAnon we've had the capital riots uh, yep. we have had literally uh, politicised putting a piece of you know paper or fabric over your face to stop infecting people with a deadly disease and people yep. don't want to do that so that's all irrational to me yeah but they're real and that's happened. So now I fully, I'm fully, fully convinced that should a situation like that occur in a supermarket, then everybody could react specifically in that way, should they be sort of riled up in the same way. And I think the second thing to that is, yes, whenever there's anything, sort of sirens and panic mm-hmm. and panic buying and being somewhere in shelter and not knowing where your loved ones are and not being able to leave or go and check on them. Yes. I think that all hits really, really different now because we lived it. 
you know, and, and I know we didn't have tentacles, but we lived it. There's something about supermarkets specifically too, isn't there? Like, you know, do you remember the ridiculousness of everyone panic buying toilet rolls and things? Yeah. There was almost that feeling like you were in the mist, like yeah. walking into a supermarket early on in the pandemic when shelves were bare. People were pushing each other out the way. People were like basically just fighting each other for supplies and stuff yeah. and yeah i mean there's a line isn't there like you, you know straight from king i'm sure where they say something like oh you know we are civilized but as soon as you strip that stuff away we become basically yeah. like cave people again yeah. essentially yeah. right um yeah put and people in the dark and get them scared that's it and they'll do whatever yeah they, you know they, that is scary because that is true um, and the supermarket in general, I think, is a really fun... I mean, it's been done with zombie films, of course. It's been done with shopping malls in Dawn of the Dead. But there's something about supermarket that is quite fun for this kind of scenario too. Because obviously you've got supplies, you've got places yeah. to hide. But also there's that vulnerability of that window, isn't there? Like, yeah. I love the fact that so many of the shots are just characters looking out at that window, yes. you know, like a giant cinema screen almost or something. But it, lo- it it works for amazing visuals in that way, doesn't it, I think? Yeah, Ollie literally says, like when they come back into the supermarket, he's like, the whole front of the place is plate glass. And yeah. again, straight from the novella. And But it's beautifully simple. It just says, hey, th- you, you're literally in a, a goldfish bowl with yeah. very thin, there's nothing keeping you from the outside, not really. Oh, God. Ah. It's so good, isn't it? Um, shall we talk about Mrs. Carmody uh, for a moment? <laughs> yes. uh, you know, arguably the real monster of this film, right? Played by Marcia Gay Harden. Just think, what an incredible performance. What do you think of this character, Louise? She scares the hell out of me. <laughs> Just terrifying. Like, Absolutely she's, terrifying. She's terrifying because she plays it so... While it does become completely theatrical yes. with her swigging milk, and I'd just like to say about the milk that she's swigging, if the fridges have been off, oh. a day later, she's swigging warm milk, Gross. which is just the most disgusting thing you can think of because you know Gross. they've thought of that. You know yep. that the reason, and it's you can see like there's a thickness to it. And yes. that becomes part of her performance is her drinking this milk. Yeah. But even from the get-go, you know, her, her hair's up. She looks a particular way. Mm. Everyone thinks she's a bit mad. She's sort of screaming about death and don't go out there. No one, <laughs> one, no one's listening to her. But the gradual build of her having followers yes. is just... Oh, the idea of people suddenly thinking she's the same one. Oh my is god! Amazing. And you know, you mentioned QAnon, but there is this feel like there is this. Uh, this is something also that Midnight Mass explored really cleverly. I think yeah. where if you look for it, you can find any rationale of what's happening from the Bible in some mm-hmm. way. Like you can twist religion to make everything around you make sense if you really want to, right? And and there's yeah. something really clever about this film because. Yes, what she's saying is terrifying and nonsense, but she sort of keeps being proven right over she's, and over again, doesn't she? About Yeah, she builds logic. Yes, yeah, she she weirdly be- and you can see why some characters might decide to follow her and there's that moment of course as well, that brilliant moment when the the bug creature kind of comes up to her but then spares her as well. Like yeah. she doesn't get killed by the creatures. She doesn't get that horrible death that you might want a character like that to get like some George Romero characters you know she'd be the one that would be ripped to shreds by zombies yep. but she doesn't get that in this you know and there's something really eerie about her all the way throughout because she's just mad enough but also calm enough at the same yeah. time to kind of you know be sort of believable for some people in that scenario you know the the bug thing yeah. is weird because that's why actually one slight difference in the novella in the novella they decide that the bugs can smell them. And mm. when the bugs can smell them, that's when they come and get them. Right. Um, but in the movie, when she's got that horrible bug on her, maybe it's because she stays still. Maybe mm-hmm. it's like when you've got a wasp on you. Yes. <laughs> you run around and it stings you. Exactly. But maybe if you stay still with a demonic bug on you, which is what she did, mm-hmm. then maybe it won't sting you and do that horrible, horrible thing which happened to that poor, oh, poor girl. Don't, yeah. Where she yeah. was inflated by poison from another dimension unbelievable like, yeah. it was hideous unbelievable i don't know why i don't know why anaphylactic shock is more terrifying when it's done with something that we don't understand it, i don't know why that's even more terrifying no no it's so true but it is it's uh 
it's a chilling moment. It's a really great moment, that moment when she kind of just like squares off against the bug that then leaves her. You're right. It's probably from a logical perspective because she remains completely still and silent, right? And not because God has spared her. I hope but not. But the film like... kind of leaves that dangling in a way, doesn't totally. it? It's like, totally. well, maybe that is the case. But then, of course, we also have this whole military explanation as well. Um, let's let's talk about the monsters then. It's because, oh my God, I almost forgot actually with this film how many monsters there are you know in my head it was just that big thing um and there are so many different incredible monsters and creature designs all of them terrify me equally right yeah <laughs> yep. um but first of all we've got this lovecraftian undescribable menace right and yeah. what a brilliant way of you know something we've talked about a lot throughout this series is how you put that kind of lovecraftian horror on screen that kind of yeah. indescribable awe inspiring yet terrifying creature and frank darabont does it so well by showing us so little of it doesn't he i yeah. think but what do you think of the 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 way in which, which that giant beast is is kind of portrayed in this well i guess i'd never i think when i watched it at the first time when i saw it in the cinema and any time i've seen it since i don't think i really appreciated the kind of sort of cosmic horror element of it i didn't because i don't think i knew what cosmic horror was and i didn't i, I didn't ever have a sort of thing of oh this is the unknown this mm-hmm. is you're not afraid of slashers you're afraid of something that is unknowable and almost impossible but it also meant that when i read and if you don't mind me being a bit wanky i'm going to oh, read please. this line from from the mist novella because it's this idea of because king perfectly nails what cosmic horror is he basically says i realized with fresh hot this is when he's seen bugs I realised with fresh horror that new doors of perception were opening up inside. New? Not so. Old doors of perception. The perception of a child who has not yet learned to protect itself by developing the tunnel vision that keeps out 99% of the universe. Children see everything their eyes happen upon, hear everything in their ears range. But if life is the rise of consciousness, as a cruel work sampler my wife made in high school proclaims, then it's also the reduction of input. Terror is the widening of perspective and perception. The horror was in knowing I was swimming down to a place that most of us leave when we get out of diapers and into training pants. So it's the idea that we are at our most core Mm -hmm. and we are seeing everything Mm. it's just absolutely yeah basically he talked about his mind trying to tear completely loose from its moorings which is just exactly how i feel and i'm sorry for reading that but it's absolutely how it's perfect what a great way to describe it that idea as well of kind of you grow older you become more logical and your tunnel vision gets narrower right You, you you can't see 99 percent of what's around you potentially and that idea of kind of other things and other horrors lurking just on the periphery is a really i love that idea but of we just don't want to see them we don't we want, just to, see don't want to see them and if we do see it it it's we lose our mind basically yeah, it drives us insane it, it literally insane. opens it opens a part of our brain that goes uh uh-uh, you you can't do that and it's funny i feel that i don't know do you feel that with certain scares in horror movies like the one scare that does it with me is that um the door opening and it follows Oh my god! With yeah. a, with a man stepping in, because I genuinely feel like that's so overwhelming for my brain. The idea that that could happen if I opened a door, that my brain goes, no, 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 we're not thinking about that. <laughs> we're never, we're never thinking about the tall man. I get that a bit in The Shining, like which we've discussed, like these kind of indescribable images that kind of push me beyond just being scared and being really like I don't I can't even comprehend what I'm seeing and why I'm feeling the way I'm feeling about it you know um Stephen King very good at that kind of thing clearly uh yeah it doesn't even need to be bugs with human teeth why are there bugs with human teeth why why I don't like it Louise (laughs) I don't like any of it uh let me start off by asking you about the big tentacled monster like we said the CGI itself is a little bit dodgy Yep. But even this terrified me, right? The scene in the back storage room, yep. the the tentacles that kind of open up and they all have these little spiky little... bits. Oh mm-hmm. my god! We're both, we're both on Zoom, <laughs> making little hands at each making other. Little Freddy <laughs> This claws. is my tentacles. Yeah. <laughs> Don't like it. Don't like any of nope. it. Poor boy that played the Shermanator in American Pie gets dragged yes. out of <laughs> out of there, um, yeah. and that in itself already is like, oh my god, you're losing faith in the humans by this point, right? Where our hero is like, don't go out there, and all the other men are like, they don't even. It's not like they even want to go out there for logical reasons. It's because they want to go out there just because, because. and just to prove that guy wrong, right? Yeah. Um, 
it's the kind of arrogance and ignorance of people uh, in that scene as well. It's yeah, absolutely horrific, isn't it? Small mindedness. Yes. To that, but that those tentacles, those tentacles bother me because not just because they're giant tentacles and you don't know what they're attached to, which I think mm. is a really good thing of what were they even attached to? What are they coming from? What yes. are these giant wriggly things coming under the door? But also, once he started being sort of wrapped up in them, they would just they started just pulling his flesh off. <laughs> So it was like they were covered in, they would just literally rip. So when you think about a sucker, like right now, I have a lush monster octopus that I got over <laughs> Halloween. And it's great. And it smells like blackcurrant. And Amazing. it's got, but, but it even has little fake suckers on it. The thing is, like an octopus has suckers. That's okay. Like you can, you can pull them off. These weren't suckers. Like this is literally like ripping flesh. Mm. They are, they are designed. You can tell that they are designed to rip. Flesh. Yes, like little claw, it's like yeah. little claw suckers or something, right? Yeah, it's- everything about them is rip and tear and deface and eviscerate. That is the theme of the. And, and 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 all of these creatures do in some way resemble stuff that we know, right? Just enough. And I think this is something very important. This is something we've talked about a lot with the xenomorph in the alien films. That idea that like it looks a little bit like a spider or it looks a little bit like you know whatever, um, and. You know, we'll get to the fact that some of these later look like wasps and look like spiders and everything. This thing is, it, like you said, it's like a giant octopus. It's like a giant squid or something, isn't it? But also this uncanny nature to it where, like you yeah. say, it's also got claws. It will also rip you to shreds. Absolutely terrifying. Horrible. And I think, <laughs> and I think that's the magic of this entire movie, isn't it? Sort of concentrated into one scene, which yes. is the pointlessness of humanity who doesn't need to go out the door, going out the door and being attacked by the horrific thing that they didn't even need to be attacked by in the first place. Exactly. It could have been avoided. the whole theme. Yeah. Totally. It is the whole theme, especially when we get to the Melissa McBride character, i.e. Carol from The Walking Dead, who leaves and then we see her at the end, right? So you're you're absolutely right. That is basically like, look how easily you could have potentially gotten out of this. But anyway, um, that's an amazing creature. Then, of course, the next like, the next type of monster we see are those little wasps, right? And that yes. amazing sequence looked amazing on my big OLED telly. <laughs> the the <Dead>. um, <laughs> bugs landing yes. on the window and they're the all thud. Going, oh, the thud as they all oh. go towards the light. And I am I'm not good with wasps, Louise. It's one of my big phobias. And these flying things are the things that scare me the most in this film. But even that first image of them uh landing on the window and again this kind of mix of fear and awe right like Mm -hmm. i think it's the marcia gay harden character isn't it she's looking at them and she's going wow look at those stingers and everything it's like she's almost in awe of these creatures isn't she um but my god these are just absolutely the stuff of nightmares as well aren't they these wasp creatures they're 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 horrific in a way that I, un- I understand immediately why Darabont wanted black and white because imagine seeing those for the first time if you'd watched them in black and white because mm. your brain would fill out the rest. Yes. So actually it's almost making them less scary because they have to have a slight colour to them. But the fact that they've got those they've got those little eyes that kind of move around, they have those enormous stingers that we see what that does <gasps> to that poor girl. She, like, ugh, it's not even a thing. I can't... But I think what's especially it, awful about it is when you realize that they're not they're just the bugs they are literally just the bugs they're the small things yes. for whatever the hell is out there and then the bigger thing arrives and it doesn't want them in the supermarket it wants the bugs because suddenly earth has become its ecosystem where it's feeding there and suddenly you're like you're just seeing this supermarket as just this one moment this one tiny place that humanity lives yes. amidst this giant Lovecraftian Hell cosmic horror world. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, it is, and 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 again, like the 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 the, the relatability, the rec- there's something recognisable about the way these creatures behave and move. They go towards the light. It's like when you're mm-hmm. outdoors at night, sitting around a a bonfire or something, and you have moths flying at you, right? Because they go towards the light. It's that horrible, familiar thing that we've all experienced with these kind of small flying creatures, except that they're giant and deadly. Uh, And like you say, can sting people with deadly, you know, hell dimension venom that makes that poor girl's face swell up like a balloon. It's just just I'll be honest, when I was reading, I'd gone to bed to read the novella and I turned off my light already and I was reading on my phone. And when you're reading on your phone, your phone is the only light in the room. Oh, no. No, no. No, No, what are you? Are you a mosquito? It's November. What are you? It was just a fly. But it 
it went it was going towards the, the, <laughs> the, the one area I did not want it to which was directly in front of my face I ended up reading under my duvet like a child Yes. <laughs> so that the fly didn't find me. It's amazing. That's <laughs> I probably amazing. ate it overnight as well. Um, and then, of course, the reason the window smashes is because this other bigger beast thing flies at the window, right? And what is that? It's like some sort of bat slash pterodactyl from yep. hell, right? That it's so ungainly. It just like crashes into things, doesn't it, as well? It's yep. just horrific. It's almost <laughs> like nothing has been... Nothing has really evolved in that world for, you know, we, Darwinism is a thing. It's a yeah. nice thing and everything kind of makes sense, but it doesn't even follow. It's not very well designed. No. These aren't very well designed creatures, which makes them even more terrifying because they don't really even make any sense. No. And actually they're, they're kind of as deadly and scary as they are. They're kind of killable too, right? Like yeah, these people are rubbish. able to just like smash them with a stick that's on like a torch basically. Yeah. Right. Um, so thank goodness you can survive them in this film because that's it when that window smashes you think well that's it isn't it that's it the mist's in they're fucked yeah Yeah. but but they managed to fight them off but it's just a horrible thing it's a really Um. horrible thing and it's smashing around those shelves and oh my god I hate it these moments of just absolute pure terror for me and then of course the other thing we see which I know you are not a fan of Louise is the scene when a group of our main characters go off to the pharmacy and they discover there's a body kind of hanging in some sort of web cocoon thing that bursts into loads of spider creatures uh, with human teeth, right? Human teeth? They have human teeth? <laughs> I Why know how you, you put... feel about teeth, Louise. I, I, we know how I feel about teeth. Um, <laughs> the the spider sequence, and it's funny, someone on Instagram uh, messaged me after I was, they saw my, I was posting on Instagram stories. They're like, is it true that there's spiders in this? Because I've been told not to watch it. Mm. Now, I don't think, you know, I know a, lo- a lot of people that are really, really bothered by spiders mm. who s- can't watch them in anything. This is probably the worst spiders that I have seen in anything. They yes. are awful. They like are. They are scuttly demons. And at one point you see them jumping from like bar stool to bar stool in this old school pharmacy. And that's not to mention the fact that they create acid webs, which will <gasps> literally remove your flesh through your genes, should some of them tumble onto your leg. Just (gasps) drift through the air and remove you from yourself. So good, right? So good. What a fun design as well. And like something we've talked about so much this series is about different alien designs. And again, you kind of think the xenomorph is sort of unbeatable in its incredible design with its acid blood and its face hugging and its chest bursting. But I think the creatures in the mist collectively... Yes. Are some of the coolest creatures ever as well, whether it's, you know, that mix of, and the difference in sizes and scales, but how they're all so deadly and terrifying in their own way. It's, yeah, the spiders with human teeth that spin acid webs. That's really not. That's high on the list. That wins monster bingo. That's just (laughs) nasty, isn't it? I mean, it's just like, I was texting you because I was like, I was forgetting. I was like, it just gets worse and worse. I was like, this film is relentless. Like every time you think you've seen the worst thing you can see, something worse appears. Comes out of the mist. (laughs) And, And even then, you're not free of it because then really sad things happen oh. in the supermarket itself you know yes is it uh, the character that takes their own life and is the other characters that take their own lives and suddenly you're like you've just got you're just pummeled yes. consistently where if you're not being attacked in the eyes with horrific monsters that you don't even want to let into your brain it's the emotional effect of that happening right in front of you it's the human well let's talk about the human horror like like we said aside from all those terrifying creatures it's kind of just as terrifying because of what's going on with these people isn't it like you said we've got suicides we get that poor man that is like really badly burnt there's all these other there's these religious fanatics there's this division growing oh my god what did you think of this and the way this is handled this kind of escalation of human chaos i suppose throughout the film i think i probably found that much more unbearable oh, than i did the so monsters upsetting. because you can fight monsters absolutely but suddenly you can't i think what i think what's especially scary in that is seeing the people change so someone like i think is his name myron he was yes. the guy that uh, david had the fight with and he was the one that made the bag boy go out he comes back and he's quite insulting towards uh Miss Carmody but then he becomes a convert and I think that seeing him you know praying and agreeing with her after being so vehemently against I think that's much scarier because you know you can hear her whispering about human sacrifice and all the rest of it to fix whatever has happened so I think watching 
watching the the sort of the gatherings of people in the sort of supermarket aisles is genuinely the most it's really scary and it's even really those scary. even those little moments like the um brent the neighbor who you know you, that that kind of absolute denial that he slips into right where he refuses yeah. to accept the monster to his own detriment in the end but you almost again i kind of thought of covid deniers and things like that yeah. right it's that absolute like you build this wall around yourself and you refuse to acknowledge that this is really happening that it's some sort of hoax that it's some sort of conspiracy or something like that you know um it's terrifying and yeah the growing religious fanatics the moment when you know one character is killed and then they're like oh the beast will quieten down but let's wait and see tomorrow will be another day and everything goes yeah. quiet and it all dips to black and you're like oh my god and that little so boy so many fades to black so, so many, many fades, fades to, black. to black i kind of love it again like you said you've mentioned this but there's not until the end when there's some of the most horrific music you'll ever hear but there's not that much music it's yeah. it's a quiet film isn't it despite mm-hmm. all the chaos as well there are dips to black there are moments of silence of calm well of not calm but of quiet menace i suppose and you also know? the silence One, of i love, I love actually because you never hear what happens to Brent. Because in the novella, you do. Mm. <laughs> in the novella, Brent is not okay when he goes out. But actually, in the movie, you don't you don't actually hear that. Right, yeah. Um, but it's the fact that just before they go out, he says, you've already psyched out my people already. Because mm. he's created he's created his own tribe. He's created he's divisions, saying, he's, yeah. Ah, he's using my people. It's like, they're not your people. And you're about to get everybody killed. And like going out with that rope, I think that was a lovely <gasps> scene that I loved. Was the rope incredible? Like again, what an amazing way of showing us something without showing us anything, Nothing. right? Yeah. The man going out tied to a rope. The rope gets tighter and tighter and tighter. There, ha- that horrible kind of moment of rope burn, which I always hate yes. seeing in a film, right? <laughs> yeah. Oof! As as something whisks this man away. Yep. And then the fact that the rope thing goes all loose and drops yeah. to the floor and it's like, oh shit. And then they pull it back and the rope gets bloodier. Everyone mm-hmm. starts panicking. And then we just see that. What is it? Just like half a human it's on just the half end of a that human. rope. Oh yeah. God. Just just some Amazing. just some legs, which then I love because um something drags it away in the night. Yes. Which is particularly terrifying. It's the fact that they don't <laughs> they don't waste anything. <laughs> Just like so that disappears. Good. You don't even see what pulls it, but something does. So oh. good. This movie is perfection. And then we get that sort of, you know, as much explanation as I think we need about two thirds of the way into the film where we're basically kind of told by a, it, it's a military thing, right? That the, yeah. the military have been conducting some sort of strange experiments. They've accidentally kind of punched a hole into another dimension, into another world, right? And that world has kind of seeped into our own. Would it have been even better if we'd had no explanation, do you think? If that little military explanation hadn't even been included in the script, I wonder, and there'd just been this mist just because. I think personally I don't love just because. Yeah. I think I like to have a re like even if I can't explain the things itself and and I can't explain any of it, but the idea even I, I suppose that's the same thing as the creature design, isn't it? It needs to be as close as possible to to an, a degree to our reality so that we can understand it. Yes. And I suppose that's our way of making it more of an uncanny valley is knowing that there was a science thing and that's all we actually need yeah. is there was a science thing and now there's a monster thing. Yes. And I think that's I think that's more connect i think you can connect to that a bit more because you can connect to its place and in the fact there's like oh there's they've always been doing experiments up there in the hill etc i agree i agree and i think again it's like they don't overdo it it's just enough of an expert it's like two sentences basically but it's like okay fine and then of course that poor man from the military is sacrificed in probably one of them well at this point in the film at least one of the most upsetting scenes so far isn't it i think that kind of that sacrifice the stabbing the panic the tears so the screaming it's so physical it's so visceral it's so animalistic the children mm. like the little boy crying and screaming and laurie holden is crying and like the whole thing like every performance is exquisite i think in that scene and and even for a moment mrs carmody reacts like really scared yeah. by what's just happened too right as well and i don't know it's just so much going on with these performances and the way that scene is directed isn't it it's wonderful she's got such and because i think it's her realizing that she has that power yes she was the one that did it she yes. did it yeah and god i hate her she's evil evil uh and this is when 
our main characters decide right we've just got to get the hell out of there um because yeah. what what at this point what alternative is there basically there's no choice like you might as well try and go for it so there's a little group of them and of course mrs carmody is guarding the front window of the store with a little knife and her bottle of milk and uh Warm milk. She, i think <sighs> i think she says we want the boy doesn't she yes. at that point she's decided who she wants and the whore as the well the boy and the says. whore oh my god uh and and then of course we get brilliant toby jones and his gun right as well i love is, him love him i've never been more grateful for a gun right in a film at that point it's like and only one God. of them had one yeah because that gun is very much a Chekhov's gun isn't it I mean it's there from yes, the beginning and you're like yeah. oh god when is this gun going to be used ha- somebody bad is going to get hold of this gun and actually the gun is ultimately sort of used for good in the end yeah, in a oh, weird definitely. way isn't it so um, but it's a great moment and then I suppose we should talk about the end sequence shouldn't we mm. <laughs> this is the reason why so many people I think tweeted me going I can't I can't watch that film ever again because of because of the ending of this film uh, where we have David and his little boy and the other couple, the older couple who escape um, and Laurie Holden's character, right? So there's five of them. They drive into the mist uh, and they just keep driving and keep driving right until they eventually run out of petrol. That sequence as they are driving away from the supermarket with, I think it's the piece of music is called The Host of Seraphim. Oh. Um, and it is just the most hair raising music. Yes. And then you see that thing. <gasps> the giant thing. The giant thing. Yes. That's an, and that's another unhinged brain thing because it's just a giant tentacly giraffe cow skyscraper <laughs> creature. And it's just this, like, it's just this abhorrence that goes overhead and they can feel it shuddering the car it shudders the car like they literally are staring up at it and the car is shaking and this is the world that they have they've been brought into and I guess it explains the world that they want to take themselves out of as well and there's a sort of again there's a feeling of sort of awe at that creature as well isn't there I think when we see it of just how huge and incomprehensible it is and you can barely see the top of it because of the mist but also did you notice all of the little things flying around it as well like the little ecosystem ecosystem around it around it yeah horrible last week we talked about cloverfield and there was something very similar the big beastie in cloverfield and then the little beasties that literally drop off it as well it's like it's its own living ecosystem horrible but yeah uh absolutely incredible that music is incredible you just know it's not going to end well at this point right like there is this real feeling of hopelessness like that's it like you said louise the world has gone the world has changed as we know it um And then they make a decision very quickly, right? As you've pointed out, to use the four bullets left in the gun that they have. I take longer to choose what I eat at McDonald's. (laughs) And I have known that menu my entire life. And I take longer. Even if I was in the apocalypse and had just seen the giant creature that we just mentioned, I think I might wait five minutes before shooting the occupants of the car. (laughs) And then screaming in the most awful, inhumane way as I click the empty trigger into my own mouth. In the most... I mean, Bleak oh. doesn't even cover it. People were texting me saying, oh, I don't think I've ever seen The Mist. Should I watch it? And I just watched that and thought, I, I don't know if you should. It's, I can't be the one responsible for you watching what I've just watched. It's unbelievable. I was... Like, I felt like I went pale watching this scene. Mm-hmm. Uh, <sighs> It's it's like Lars von Trier level of upsetting, I think. It's really mean and it's really upsetting. But yeah, just that decision that they come to very quickly. Like you say, mm-hmm. we cut to a... It's beautifully. I think it's beautifully done as well because we cut to a sort of wide shot from the outside of the car. So we just hear, don't we, four gunshots. And then like you say, his guttural scream of just utter madness. He's yep. completely lost his mind at this point too, totally. right? Unhinged. cosmic horror has taken hold of him essentially and like you say then him firing that empty gun into his mouth over and over again just hoping to die it's just it's just unbelievable and then and then the next moment is (laughs) is the moment where for me 
it almost pushes it over from devastating into almost a punchline, right? Like, yes, it I, is. I actually laugh at the next moment in just how mean-spirited it is, but he's killed his little boy. He's killed those other three people in the car. And the old people, that's the... I, the I don't know why people. I struggle. The, it's the fact it hits every single one of the weaknesses, doesn't it? Yes. It doesn't just... It, it gets rid of the fact that you've been rooting for these characters the whole time mm. and your film brain tells you that once you've got away from the bad people in the supermarket, you get away from everything. Yes. But you don't. And the fact it's double elderly, child. And lady, yeah, woman, child and, and, and everyone. old. It's yeah. just, ah, oh, and yeah. then it's just him that's left. It's just like yeah, the white straight guy that's yeah. left. <laughs> yeah. Just like... Yeah. Oh my God. And then it... it... <laughs> He he gets out of the car and just like he just like turns his back to the to the mist and says, Just, just hurry up and take me, right? Come and yep. kill me. And then the music comes back, the music swells as we see out of the mist this giant tank filled with military, <laughs> behind it this truck filled with people that have been rescued, including characters like we saw earlier in the film, like Carol mm-hmm. from The Walking Dead. Uh safe and sound with her child they've been rescued the mist is starting to die away we're beating it right yep (laughs) and they've got flamethrowers they've got flamethrowers helicopters like it's safety it's 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 a rescue and david just like drops to his knees and again just screams just knowing that he's just killed everyone in his life yeah uh, that matters for nothing and it was all for nothing the end (laughs) <laughs> the end. And then, did you? I don't know how long did you watch the. How long did you watch the credits for? Oh, because not that, the credits not that long. The credits just ended up. I can't remember if the music started and then faded away. But halfway through the credits, you just heard helicopters oh and tanks, and then you heard him scream again. And then there were more <sighs> tanks and more cars, as if they were still driving past him, all the way through the end credits. Because I think I was in shock, so I just hadn't turned it off, and it just kept going. I was like, where? what's going to happen here? But no, it was just the sound of helicopters overhead. They were just passing him. They were still passing him. It's a really funny, it's a real mean decision to make, isn't it? And I don't know, I go back and forth about whether, whether it's almost that was one step too far. Like, could it have, I think I would have been more emotionally distressed had it just ended after the shooting in a way. Um, But then to actually show you the rescue, like I said, there's something so mean spirited about it that it it almost brings me out of it and makes me laugh. But then also I'm kind of grateful for that too, because I was feeling so, I was feeling so upset like 30 seconds earlier as well, you know, so I can't quite make up my mind about it. But what do you think of that? No, I do think about it and the sort of ridiculousness. It's like um, Sam Neill at the end of The Mouth of Madness, yes. like watching his own film and yes. just howling <laughs> yeah. at how horrific the things are that have happened to him are. Yeah. Like that's, yeah. that is very cosmic in that way. Very. That, that's exactly the same Lovecraftian awfulness. Absolutely. In a it's something me and Becky um, talked about with Event Horizon and also with From Beyond, where Barbara Crampton just lets out this guttural laugh slash scream of horror at the end of the film. Yes. And it's that cosmic madness has taken hold of her. Um, it's it's so good. I love it. And you do yeah. feel a bit like that cosmic madness has taken hold of you by the end of that film, yes. right? I did feel it. I was in shock after that ending. And I know what you mean about it almost being hilariously vindictive because it's not actually we don't get endings like that we just no, don't and don't. I was reading that um, Darabont apparently I don't know how true this is he apparently sacrificed his entire di- his entire directorial fee in exchange for that ending mm-hmm. and ha- and um, half of the budget so that film was made for cheap because he wanted to do that at the end and nobody liked that yes. <laughs> because that's not how Hollywood films end <clears throat> it's just not killing Showing a small boy about to wake up before cutting to outside while his dad shoots him in the head is not how movies go in 2007 or even 2021. No. and like, this was, It just doesn't happen. And let's not forget, this was produced by the Weinsteins. This was a Dimension yes, was. film. Weinsteins... Extra horror. Again, you could imagine, though, that they would not go for an ending like that because they would go for the most safe, audience-friendly, get-as-much-money-in-as-possible kind of an ending, totally. right? And yeah, I'm, I wouldn't be surprised if he did have to sacrifice his whole fee in order to yeah. get that over the Weinsteins, right? Um, yeah. And was it too much for audiences? I mean, I don't think this film was as well received critically or even commercially as it should have been, right? No, but I don't think so. It it didn't... I don't think it did make waves particularly, especially like like we said at the beginning, in this era of horror you know, of paranormal activity and all of these other huge films that cause such a stir in the genre. 
this was like this weird little outsider film, wasn't it? That I feel yeah. like only over time people have really started to appreciate and love, I yeah. think. You know? I think it has taken time. I mean, I'm trying to remember how people felt. I went to see it in the cinema in 2007. Yeah, I did see same. it in the cinema because I remember I remember the state of everyone when we got out. <laughs> yes. So it was just like, there was just this sort of shocked silence as everyone kind of shuffled out of the cinema going, we should have a drink. We should just <laughs> yeah. drink. Yeah. yeah, drink. I remember it was um, the same feeling as I had at the end of Her- Hereditary where I was like, yes. I just wandered out into the street quiet, just like, I need to go to a pub. <laughs> <laughs> I need to go where the people are. Yes. Very little mermaid of you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Exactly. Um, yeah. Was it just too mm. much for people, do you think, that ending? Maybe. I think it is. Again, by the reaction that we got, even on social media, saying that we were watching this film, people were just like, oh. like I, I think it's upset a lot of people, this film, yeah. hasn't it? Um, it is upsetting. And I think that's that's a testament to its character development. You know, yeah. I think that's what we that's what we struggle not struggle with but it's what a lot of films struggle with when we watch a film because we are introduced to characters that in order for it to be a horror movie we understand that half of at least a quarter of those characters are going to die yeah um but we must have some kind of connection to them otherwise it just feels like the i know what you did last summer tv show (laughs) exactly and also you know me and you have spoken about this before we're not like big fans of super mean-spirited horror movies no. you know and Mm-mm. even compared to a lot of the stuff that came out of this era it was a mean-spirited time for horror in a way right yes. but it doesn't bother me in this there's something about and like i said like we said at the beginning there's this balance of warmth and humanity as well as this incredible meanness about this film that i think is yeah. just perfect you know it kind of scares me how um how Stephen King has predicted a lot of things. Mm. You know, me thinking about those reactions to things. I mean, he he is his books from thirty years ago mm-hmm. have predicted an awful lot. Yes. You know, he he wrote a book um, called Rage. Do you know anything about Rage? No. So he bought it was a novella called Rage, and he wrote it as Richard Bachman when he did his uh, various that uh, was his pen name that he kind of wanted to see if he could people would read him if he wasn't Stephen King. Right. So he put stuff out as Richard Bachman. Yeah. And, Richard Bachman's rage was about a school shooting and it was before Columbine, obviously. And when Columbine happened, Stephen King was aghast. You know, he couldn't think that people would do what had been, you know, written in his book. He thought it was too horrible. But he, So they took that away. They unpublished it. So the only copies of rage you can find are probably digital and in charity shops because he literally, that was pulled from existence. He also, at the end of The Running Man, he uh, had the character at the end of The Running Man fly a plane into the highest building in the city. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. There's a whole ton of Stephen King stuff that you think is so horrible that would never happen that has happened over the last 30 years absolutely um the, like the dead zone as well about this terrifying man becoming president of the united states oh yes that'll do as it well right but yeah no it's so true and and that's the thing i think about stephen king it's, i find it similar with wes craven that yes he creates these absolutely horrific upsetting disturbing stories but it comes from a place of like th- he is scared of this stuff like you yes. can feel that he is putting yes pet cemetery is an absolutely devastating terrifying story but stephen king himself found it so devastating and terrifying right that he could barely yeah. even show it to people and i think totally. you feel that you feel that heart even at his most dark terrifying stories that it's not like when somebody makes a horror film and they're like oh i just think it's really cool to put this in yeah. it's more like no rob zombie yeah exactly mm. this is more like no no look how upsetting this is and look how upsetting yeah. i find it i'm gonna put my nightmares on screen or on a, in a book and let yeah. you live through them basically <laughs> and yeah yeah it's uh what an incredible job that him and darabont yeah. have done with this film totally perfect movie right perfect yeah. movie perfect um there you go. Anything else you want to say on The Mist before we wrap up or have, um, we, have we covered everything? I'm going, to, I'm going to do that thing where I look at my notes, yes. Mike. Yes, please of, do. <laughs> of which are all, they're all in caps. Mm-hmm. And earlier, I, <laughs> when I was writing about the spiders, I just pushed through a thing that said, itchy, scratchy, bursty. <laughs> oh. <laughs> which is a Resident Evil reference, but I was like, oh, I'm just going to say this. The, oh, God. the little ones that burst as well, they remind me of those videos that people share of like, what, you know, oh, in the corner of this room, it looks like a clump of fluff and then somebody touches it with a stick and like 800 and mini it's... spiders scuttle mm-hmm. away, you know? It's like that oh, visual, isn't it? It's horrible. Like the, the nightmare of what you actually have sucked into your hoover yes. when you think that you've got rid of one. No, I think I think in terms of... Um, <laughs> 
the world is so wrong. It's just one of these things. I've been <laughs> the spindly tentacle monster of awful. No, I think we've covered it. I think we've covered everything I really wanted to say about the mist. Um, my final question for you: Who is scarier, right, Mrs. Uh, Mrs. Carmody from this film, Margaret White from Carrie, or mm. um, Bev from Midnight Mass, right, as like three? king or king adjacent terrifying religious fanatic women (laughs) the ones that we have now coined the holy trinity the holy trinity (laughs) of terrifying Uh, women um carmody yeah very closely followed by bev yeah um yeah margaret white carmody's the og carmody's (laughs) the og margaret white's terrifying but only to her own daughter not so she's actually quite polite to other people yeah that's almost scarier isn't it (laughs) yeah yeah because at least um actually there was one insult that Carmody she said if I was looking for a friend like you I'd squat and shit one out yes and it's just the most disgusting thing <laughs> and Laurie Holden's <laughs> expression it's so good it's yeah, perfect because so she's she's also almost laughing because yeah. it's the most disgusting but it's also just like wow you're a you're a piece of work you're something yeah. very interesting yeah incredible yeah. stuff what a film um well there you go well louise thank you so much thank you for taking one for the team and putting yourself through this absolute horror show uh, in order to have this discussion with me well, thank you for having me i was been i've been listening to the alien series and going it's almost miss time oh, it's I'm almost kind missed of, time it's almost miss time we can do this i've been so looking forward this. to it um and just remind me where people can remind us where people can find you and more of your work out there online uh you'd be best heading to my twitter i'm at shiny underscore demon mm-hmm. so over the next couple of weeks um i think our final Sound of Gaming show on Radio 3 oh. is about uh, games that we play together mm-hmm. and I have an interview I'm so excited to have an interview with two of the composers from Destiny 2 so if you like gaming soundtracks Ooh. and you like Destiny uh, I have an hour of games where you play together on Radio 3 on the first Saturday of December which I think is the 4th um, but yeah 3 o'clock you can listen there love so, it thank you Louise thank you very much thanks Mike a big thank you to the amazing Louise Blaine. What a film. Oh, God, I love The Mist. Uh, before we get into the second half of this week's episode, I'm going to take a moment to thank this week's sponsor. That's $20 Patreon subscribers, Harpy Productions. Uh, Harpy Productions sent us a little message uh, for me to read out. So they've said, hello, Mike. Just wanted to tell your listeners about our upcoming event, The Fright Before Christmas. Harpy Productions and Dance Macabre are holding a horror story competition on the 11th of December this year, bringing an old tradition back to life. Six teams of new and exciting horror creatives will join us at the Space Theatre in London, a reconstructed Victorian church, to tell six original stories and try their best to horrify and excite our audience in an evening of festive cheer and terrifying tales. Tickets are selling fast, so head to the Space Theatre website at TFB Christmas on Twitter to get yours. That's the 11th of December at the Space Theatre in London, the fright before Christmas. Uh, a huge thank you to Harpy Productions for sending in that message. I'm actually really excited about this, and Harpy Productions have very kindly uh, asked me to come along and be on the judging panel. So if you fancy coming along to this, I think it's going to be really fun. There will be an evening of live Christmas ghost stories being performed uh, by writers and performers. I'll be on the judging panel along with a couple of other uh, horror legends, and we will be judging the best short ghost story of the evening then hopefully all of us can go and have some drinks in the bar afterwards so if that sounds like your sort of thing if you're in london or in the london area please come along that's the 11th of december at the space theater in london come and join us for the fright before christmas uh one more time a huge thank you to this week's sponsors 20 dollar patreon subscribers harpy productions and don't forget if you want to become an, an official evolution of horror sponsor and you can plug your event your blog your podcast whatever you like in your own little dedicated segment then sign up now patreon.com slash evolution of horror okay let's move into the second half of this week's discussion as Layla latif and i discuss all things annihilation hello and welcome back Layla latif hi Layla. hi mike how are you 
I'm good. I'm really good. Thank you. I'm excited to discuss this movie. There's a lot of interesting meaty stuff to get into, I think, with this film. Uh, let me start off just by asking you a bit about this subgenre. Um, are you a fan, Layla, generally of sort of alien horror, cosmic horror, sci-fi horror, that kind of thing? I am. I love any kind of film that I suppose like makes your kind of brain chew. Mm-hmm. You know, that sort of like trying to pass out the details of it, trying to like figure it out a lot more. Like I love, you know, Picnic at Hanging Rock. Oh, yes. All of the yes. John Carpenter Apocalypse trilogy, I absolutely adore. And then like more in the sci-fi world, like I like Tarkovsky a lot. I mm. love Stalker, which I think is a really great um, companion piece to this one. And then yes. like, yeah, things like Mandy and The Lighthouse, very much in my wheelhouse. Love it, love it. What do you think it is that works so well for particularly the horror genre, this kind of thing, like space, the cosmos, that sort of stuff? I think there's kind of a feeling of inevitability about how like your life is actually of like absolutely no consequence in the grander scheme yes. scheme of things which is a truly upsetting thought <laughs> yes um but yeah and i think it's something this touches on that like once you get into this realm of like kind of sci-fi cosmic horror you you get so far away from motive Mm-hmm. And I think there's a line in this, which I'm probably getting completely wrong, where they say, you know, I don't know what it wants and I don't know if it wants. Yeah. And I think that's something that yeah. like cosmic horror gives us like just this ability to just completely not know what we're facing and like actually have to ask big questions of ourselves because we don't really understand what it is that we're up against. That's it. It's the it's it's like the horror of something incomprehensible, isn't it, I suppose? Like too big, too grand yeah. for, for us to get our heads around. And I love that kind of thing. And I always think it's kind of interesting to see how directors try and put that idea on screen, right? Something unthinkable, unknowable, unimaginable. It's like it's easy to write that in prose comparatively, right? Compared to somehow put that on screen. Yeah. I've not read the source material because I mean, I'm very much a person that like, if I read the book beforehand, great, but I will never go and read the book of something once I've watched the film because the image is already in my mind, like it's done. Um, but from what I understand, like the book was considered very much like an unfilmable source material. And I read an interview with Alex Garland where he said when he was adapting it for the screen, he didn't actually read it again. He just tried to capture the feelings and the kind of sense of it that he had when he was then creating a script. I love that. And, I, I, you know, I think Alex Garland will get to him, obviously. But, you know, before this, he had done mm. Ex Machina and then written a whole bunch of stuff and collaborated with people like Danny Boyle, obviously. Um, are you a fan generally of kind of Alex Garland and his other work? Yeah, I first came to him, I think, just after Titanic had come out. And because I was quite a pretentious, like, prepubescent, like, I was just like, yeah, Titanic's rubbish, <laughs> like, Leonardo DiCaprio sucks. Um, I think you're actually quite interested to watch that again because I bet it's actually pretty yeah. good. It is um, actually. It's better but, than you remember, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but then when it was announced that Leonardo's next project was going to be The Beach, I read that book straight mm. away and it just seemed like the absolute epitome of cool yeah. to me. And I loved that film very much. And that introduced me not, you know, I'd, I read the book, but then that introduced me to Tilda Swinton. Oh my God, <laughs> yeah. And all these like really like apathetic, people and I just I love that film so much and I love that book so I've kind of yeah I've been very here for Alex Garland and his like no easy answers style of writing and of films no easy answers is a perfect way to put it isn't it um he's I love how much his stuff makes me think I don't know if you saw he did a tv show called devs that was on I think the BBC last year did you happen to catch that no and I feel like not enough people saw it not enough people talked about it but it was astounding especially if you like annihilation it's that kind of Mm. mind melting sci-fi that kind of hurts your brain the more you think about it but it's it's amazing i would recommend it um so let's talk about annihilation from 2018 we've sent in drones and teams of people but nothing comes back but something has you're a biologist you served in the military if i knew what happened I could save his life. The boundary's getting bigger, it's expanding. We're talking cities, states. You need to know what's inside. So do I. It's beautiful. Check this out. It's like they're stuck in a continuous mutation. Anything interesting in there? No. 
So we have uh, Lena, who is our protagonist, who is played by da- Natalie Portman. She was formerly in the army and now she has become um, a biologist, particularly looking at um, cells. And uh, we are introduced to her doing a study to do with cancer cells in the cervix and the way that cells mutate. Um, her husband is a Green Beret who gets uh, played by Oscar Isaac and he gets sent off on a top secret mission and disappears for a year. Her assumption is that he's dead. Um, and then he appears one day in their home and he seems something is off and he quickly sort of goes into major organ failure and, you know, is bleeding out of every orifice. And, um, she then gets, um, and it turns out that he has been in the shimmer with a kind of group of, of, of other Green Berets and he is the only person that has been has emerged from this. So she is sent on a sort of quasi-rescue mission trying to figure out what has happened within this shimmer with a group of other women played by Jennifer Jason Lee, Gina Rodriguez, uh, Tessa Thompson. Um, and yeah, they each have their kind of different skill set, I suppose. And uh, they go into the shimmer and uh, shit gets weird. Absolutely. It really <laughs> does, doesn't it? Um, once they step into the shimmer, it's kind of like, oh, now we're in like predator or something right but weirder that's kind of what it feels like um (laughs) what do you think of this film Layla sort of did you see this when it first came out and what generally are your are your thoughts on the film yeah I remember this coming out quite well because the distribution of it I think particularly in the UK was very very weird like it seemed there was a lot of hype about it there was a lot of build-up and then it sort of disappeared and there was just a long speculation a bit like what happened with the green knight this year of like when is this actually going to appear and It was kind of slightly unceremoniously dumped on Netflix and I refused to see it that way. So, um, because I'd love Ex Machina so much. So I went and I did find a screening of it and caught it on the big screen. But unfortunately, with one of the rowdiest crowds I've ever been unlucky enough to be in the cinema with. Yeah. This isn't Um, the right film for a rowdy crowd, is it? It was not. It was not. There was a lot of screaming, a lot of talking, a lot of, yeah. So, um, so yeah, I then came and watched it on Netflix. So I, I'm kind of yet to have a perfect viewing experience of Ex Machina, <laughs> it's either, but um, luckily it's something that's quite hypnotic. So I've been able to sort of be drawn in enough where I think that, um, you know, I, I, I think I kind of viewed it as it was meant to be seen and that I was laser focused on it. And yeah, I've seen it a few times seen since and yeah, I, I've, it, it really is kind of unlike anything else, I suppose. And it's sort of, I mean, it's like a lot of things. So, um, I guess you kind of, Predator, I think is a good one. And Aliens and Arrival all kind of put together, but then it's wholly unique in its way. Yeah, yeah. And, and like you say, Tarkovsky, right? There's a real mood of mm. something like Solaris or Stalker or something like that, I think, in its sort of tone. Yeah. Yeah. And, and uh, I don't know what you think, it, whether it even can be like easily classified as horror because I think it's it's something like it's certainly terrifying mm-hmm. but there's such like ambiguity to it that I think that it, it it does defy easy genre classification it does it's kind of it's it's like uh, when you watch a David Lynch film isn't it or something like that it's like mm-hmm. you couldn't necessarily call it pure horror and the setup, it doesn't feel like you're in that at all. Even the soundtrack, the music, you know, this kind of like acoustic mm-hmm. guitar music at the beginning of the film. And you're like, oh, this is an interesting setup to this movie. But then, of course, it does end up in you like some of the scariest monsters and scariest set pieces in, in anything yeah. I've seen in the last 10 years, basically. So it is, it's got moments of pure horror to it, but it's... Yeah, it's a mix of so many things, isn't it? Um, I, I love this film as well. I saw it... Uh, I saw it on the big screen as well. Thank good, thank God, because it is. It was kind of a shame that it did get, like you say, sort of unceremoniously sort of dumped on Netflix. Um, I think it was just too weird and too out there for. I think it was Paramount at the time who were who were mm-hmm. making it, and um, maybe they just didn't want to take the risk with it uh, in terms of box office and that kind of thing. So, but it's such a shame, and I and I can see why to an extent because it's not predator it's not aliens it's not a big easy action film or horror film it is this sort Mm -hmm. of high concept 
it's a thinking film, isn't it? I guess, and and a sort of character drama. Um, but yeah, I loved it, and I only watched it for the second time um, this week in preparation for this, and I loved it just as much, if not more. Um, I yeah, I think it's there's so much fascinating stuff going on in this. Um, let me start off by asking you just the general kind of look and vibe of this film. Again, we've talked about Alex Garland, but what do you think of the way he's brought this story to life and these visuals and just the general kind of look and tone of this film, I suppose? I think the thing that kind of st- struck me the most now coming back and watching it again, and I think it's a bit of a damning indictment of a lot of cinema at the moment, was there was so much colour. Like, did, yeah. you, did you just feel like, when was the last time you saw something this bright Mm. like and it is like that constant thing that you have nowadays where you'll get people comparing like oh look at these sludgy marvel films compared to like the color that we had in like sam raimi's spider-man and like the way that kind of weirdly things are getting grayer and browner and kind of and and weirdly i think a lot of the time in an attempt at being like slightly profound they'll drain the color from it so i think it's a really bold move for him where That time it's like cartoonishly bright. And I do think that slightly towards the end, there is a scene where it gets a little bit, there's one moment where I was like, this is a little bit video game, you know, screensaver with (laughs) with the colors. But I was just so appreciative of of that he, he didn't feel the need to kind of, I don't know, have that sort of moodiness in the shadow and the screen. Mm -hmm. Because it adds to like how unsettling it all was for me. Yeah. And when you kind of juxtapose this like fantastical rainbow world within the shimmer, and then you're going back to the scenes with, um, you know, just with Natalie Portman and Oscar Isaacs and their kind of like, you know, marriage drama. And that bit is kind of, it becomes very matte, becomes almost a little bit kitchen sinkish. Yes. You know, like, yeah. and, 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 and kind of naturalistic. And I just think it's really, really like, somebody who's got a true like command of filmmaking mm-hmm. and yeah the thing God, i could just go on for ages about this sorry <laughs> no no yeah but- i can i completely agree with you i love how bold and colorful it looks as well and it's you're right it's just the sort of thing we don't really get anymore unless and you're right and I, I wonder if it's chris nolan that's to blame for this kind of murky Mm. murkiness of blockbusters superhero movies and that kind of thing and and yeah i i love it's such a lovely thing to see like i've got one of those tvs that has like the sort of ambi light that sort of shines a light out the back of the tv nice. onto the wall and my whole living room i like tweeted a picture of it last night because my whole living room was like glowing pink and blue and red and green and stuff and it was amazing and like you say it's kind of it's sort of hypnotic. I loved it. I, I love just being swept up in the visuals. And you're right, he makes a really strong decision visually with the difference, I suppose, between mm-hmm. when they're in the the normal world and when they're in the shimmer. But there's so much detail in the shimmer too, especially when you watch it in a, in a cinema, you can see everything kind of glistening and everything is moving too, right? Which will get to that idea that like everything is sort of mutating at all times and there's little details in plants and landscapes and production design where you can actually see things moving and refracting and glowing different colours and that kind of stuff. Mm. Let's go back to the beginning because it starts off in quite the opposite way, doesn't it? That it's, It is quite murky. It is quite dark. It is quite human at the beginning. We're introduced to this framing device where Natalie Portman is telling the story of what's happened to mm-hmm. her. Then we flash back to her relationship with Oscar Isaac and this, this kind of grief process that she's going through because... Her, his character has been missing for like a year. I'm I'm assuming she's sort of presumed him dead by this point, right? And then, of course, he returns, but he's acting strangely. The dialogue is quite stilted. It's quite cold and distant, I find, in the first act of this movie. But how do you find that, the, the human element to this story, I suppose, and the human interaction? Yeah, it's interesting because they, you know... There, there are kind of scenes where they have like a, a kind of sweet intimacy in bed and like you do feel mm. that there is like a connection between them but there is a betrayal she is having an affair and there is yeah. there is like a distance and a coldness between them and and something that i suppose is quite unknowable like they feel like there is like something that they have something quite separate from one another and as close as they would like to be one to one another there is like this barrier of the self that we can only really 
know so much about our partners and their motives. And yeah. there's a lot of like the central mystery of the film is her trying to figure out why her husband would have accepted going on this, what is essentially like a suicide mission because he's not the first. Um, yeah. And whether she plays any role in having persuaded him to do that. And, mm-hmm. um, and, and do we ever find out the reason why he went into the shimmer? Was it because he found out she was having an affair? Or was there something deeper, more psychological going on that we didn't know about? Because, again, you feel like all of these characters, apart from, I would say, maybe Gina Rodriguez's character, who seems a little bit more outgoing, but all of the rest, everyone else in this film feels very interior they're all kind of closed books none of them really (laughs) talk about what's going on in their lives right and a lot of the story is characters trying to figure out like what's with jennifer jason lee's character what's going on with her why is she chosen to come into the shimmer and why is this and all of them feel like they're quite they've they've got a lot of stuff going on internally and we we're not really privy to most of it are we with any of them including oscar isaac's character including even natalie portman's character and i wonder if that is a difficult thing for certain audiences, I wonder. Again, there's a there's an opaqueness to this film, isn't there? And I think part of that is these characters. They're all, like you say, they're quite cold and they're quite distant and they're not mm. good communicators for the best no. part. <laughs> and it kind of gets alluded to that they all have these self-destructive tendencies, not so much with Oscar Isaacs, but, mm. you know, there's references of, like, Gina Rodriguez with substance abuse problems and yes. Tessa Thompson, its character, self-harms. Mm-hmm. And, you know, at, um, is it Cass? Cass has, like, gone through yeah. some, like, terrible grief. So, I mean, in some ways, and I think he doesn't fully launch into this, but there's an idea of, uh, like, is this... You know, and Jennifer Jason, his character, has a terminal illness. It's just like, are we looking at reasons to commit suicide on yeah. some level? Because that is, you know, as much as they are on some degree coerced into doing this because this is a mission to possibly save mankind, I think the film affords them a lot of agency. And we all felt that this is something that they are personally choosing to do. And if they mm-hmm. weren't going to do it, it's, you know, not the stakes of the universe, they don't seem like they're what is actually particularly motivating any of them. It's more of a journey of self-discovery and more of a personal personal mm. thing where they're putting their lives on the line quite willingly. Yeah, there's something, like you say, there is that element of contemplating suicide, of self-destruction. I think there's, there's a lot of depression going on here as well as a lot of other uh, kind of issues that characters are juggling. <laughs> Funnily enough, I, I mentioned Lars von Trier when I talked about the end of The Mist, but there is something of Lars von Trier about this story and these characters too. It almost reminds me of something like Melancholia. There is a feeling of melancholia, I think, throughout the first act of this film, you know. Um, but I think the performances are so good that despite the coldness in the characters, they really kind of draw me in personally. What do you think of the, the performance in this film at times I felt that like Gina Rodriguez was going a little broader she's definitely bigger than the rest of them isn't she yeah yeah Yeah. everybody else has got more of an air of introspection and I love Natalie Portman so much in everything but in particular in Jackie and I think that she does this thing in this that reminded me of Jackie where somehow her voice doesn't seem to be coming from inside her body yeah it seems like she kind of manages to have this like Weird, like everything feels one step removed. Mm -hmm. And like she doesn't believe really what she's saying. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's so true. And like, you're right. Nothing she says necessarily is convincing. And and she lies a lot. And she keeps, again, she keeps a lot. She doesn't tell anyone for the bulk of the film that it was her husband that had been in and come out. Mm. And like, again, all of these characters are are hiding stuff and not revealing stuff from each other, which is really interesting. Um, So she's told, obviously, that her, what happened to her husband, is it a husband, by the way, or is he just a partner? We don't really know, do we, I suppose? Unclear. No, (laughs) no, no idea. Um, But she's told, isn't she, that her partner has come out of this thing called the shimmer which is this horrible kind of interdimensional sort of portal thing and we've just done this um we've just uh, talked about the mist and uh, the mm. mist has this same vibe right where it's like they've punk they've punched a hole between these two dimensions and these worlds are kind of bleeding into each other and it's that same kind of thing i suppose it's this kind of weird sort of gateway to this other world and it's sort of growing isn't it it's slowly expanding kind of taking over this rural area and uh she 
volunteers to go in, doesn't she? And along with these other characters, like you've mentioned, who all of them are going through something. All of them essentially, to put it really simply, don't have much to lose, right? Which is mm-hmm. essentially why they're going in. And uh, and yeah, they don't really know what they're going to find. Um, and so that's the sort of setup. And then we go into the shimmer. And this is where, like you said, everything kind of changes at this point. The colours, the the environment, the sort of genre shifts, right, mm-hmm. of the film, even when we get into the, the shimmer. Yeah, I mean, it's just stunningly beautiful. And it mm. just, I think it's like such an interesting idea because they they go very into like the shimmer is an allegory for cancer a lot of yeah, points yeah where it's just like oh this is a mutation you know cancer being and we start kind of with you know cancer we start with these cells that are shifting and mutating and this idea of uh, the shimmer is not bringing matter in in itself it's simply just like transforming this and it's growing almost like a tr- tumor and sort of making all of the matter become something that resembles what was there before, but like fundamentally sort of a destructive force yes. in some ways. But yeah. Um, yeah, oh God, there's just so much that it made me think of. I mean, like, <laughs> God, not to go back to, like I, I did a philosophy degree and so like, it made me think a lot about mm. that. But like, so there's this kind of idea, if you look at like Jude christian like ideas of creation and like stuff like that where like you know you have something then you have something new like a person like life begins the universe starts like all of these things and there's like a binary aspect to it but like pre going into the you go into like ancient philosophy that's just like nothing is created and nothing is ever destroyed everything just matter just transforms and things go either from their chaotic state into an ordered state and into yeah. chaos and that again and so i thought of obviously like cancer was clearly the thing that was like coming up but i just kept thinking of like ancient greek philosophy and like this idea of just matter becoming disordered again things being in a state of flux and then rearranging themselves into orders and then bow- back out again but nothing is created and nothing is destroyed it's just transforming that is exactly it Sorry. i'm getting a bit galaxy brain here it sounds like i it sounds like i'm stoned i promise you i'm not i love it but that's that's what this film feels like it does kind of feel like you're on some sort of trip i think and and you're right and they, it's so deliberate that it has all of these elements to it, I think, doesn't it? It's, uh, you know, it's no coincidence that of our characters, we've got one is a biologist, one is a physicist, one is a <laughs> psychologist, right? And so it's like, and all of these elements come into play in some way. Like there is this key question throughout, isn't there, as to what happened to the previous party? Did something physical kill them? Was it some sort of biological mm-hmm. disease, virus, something like that? Or did they go mad and kill each other, essentially? Did you know? Did something psychological happen to mm-hmm. you? Having said all that, right, there are all of these huge, ambitious, you know, psychological, philosophical ideas, but also there's some bloody great monsters, right, in this film. And, like, yeah. one of the first things we see when we go into the Shimmer is this alligator attack, uh, this kind of mutated, weird alligator-crocodile thing. I never quite know whether it's alligator mm. or crocodile. I'm never, not 100% sure. Well, because you can normally tell from the teeth, but then this one's got messed up teeth, so... <laughs> exactly. I think it's more alligator-shaped than it is crocodile-shaped, but who knows? Well, it's um, Florida, isn't it? So it's going to be an alligator. Good point. Very good point, yeah. <laughs> um, so, so, yeah, this... Our first moment of true kind of monster movie horror here, um, which I almost completely forgot was coming, and it really made me jump when I think it's Tessa Thompson's character, isn't it? Suddenly gets just grabbed and pulled under. Um, but what do you think of this moment and the the creature design of this weird mutated alligator thing? Well, I just love that they also kind of kept what is so monstrous about alligators in that they don't eat you straight away, they drown you and they wrench you about oh. and they try and, you know, in real life and what could possibly be worse but yes no that kind of slightly uncanny alligator that was just i mean i think that was the moment where i was just you know you know enjoying this kind of psychological beautiful design and all of this and that was the moment in the cinema where i was like i don't care that i'm surrounded by the worst people in london i'm in it i'm in this film this is for me those monstrous rows of teeth because it's just what is it about teeth <laughs> I know but like and extra teeth extra teeth there's something very creepy about it 
uncanny teeth we were just talking in the mist about how there are there are spider creatures and when they open their mouth they've got human teeth and it's one of the most unnerving things i've ever seen and there is there's something about Mm. like extra teeth different types of teeth tooth monsters in uh you know things it's horrible have you ever seen an x-ray of a like a toddler's head because they've got all the other teeth oh. inside there. Oh, no, truly. If you never want to sleep ever again, <laughs> Google like, x-ray of toddler's jaw. Oh, oh no. But yes. No. And, and, and it's, it's one of the most horrible. Sorry, it's one of the most horrifying things about shark. This, like, sharks, this idea of like regenerative teeth. Oh, my God. Absolutely. It's so true. And yeah, the, the and alligators, they really are. They're like the real bastards of the animal kingdom aren't they because they are they're so you know they, they've kind of outlasted so many other things haven't they evolutionary sort of mm. speaking you know it, and and they you, you're not safe on water you're not safe safe on land they can run they can swim they can drown you they can eat you you know what are you supposed to do you're supposed to climb a tree i think if you get attacked by an alligator because they can't climb that's the only thing no it's the only way you can get away remember that layla right. next time you're in florida you know <laughs> Get back. Jennifer! Yeah, it's a great it's a great moment and I think it's th- this moment when you go, "Oh, we're we're in this film now," right? Cuz from what started as mm-hmm. such a kind of pensive character drama really somber really subdued really internal and all those other words we've said to describe the film so far and then this big monster attack and you're just like wow what is this film you know and I kind of love that from this point onwards it's like you kind of have no idea what's going to happen next you're kind of in unknown territory a bit I think yeah and I think it speaks to that kind of like what we're talking about with cosmic horror of like almost you kind of don't need to go into space sometimes to feel that to kind of you know just remind yourself of like humanity of just being like one part in like this very very large planet with many many other things and Mm -hmm. not the apex predators and virtually any of these (laughs) ecosystems yeah and you know and to kind of you you can kind of feel that futility of like human existence within that particularly with an alligator that you know were here long before us and Mm-hmm. Yeah, and I mean, depending what takes us out, <laughs> might be here long after. Absolutely, and I wonder if there was an extra dimension added to me watching this film as well. I'm finding this with so many films these days. You revisit them in a pan- in a in the pandemic context, right? And there is something extra creepy about the. It's the biological horror of this as well that kind of made me mm-hmm. quite squeamish. And I'm not good with body horror as it is, right? But this that kind of almost Cronenbergy kind of mutation cells plants you know it's like there's a lot of this that that just there's just this idea isn't there that like and i think they they mention it midway through the film that from the second they stepped into the shimmer everything in their body is shifting and changing and refracting and and mutating and warping and stuff and that in itself is also a really scary thing about this world they've stepped into yeah i I, i'm I'm not a squeamish person but there was something particularly horrifying about this that I remember when um, the writer Christopher Hitchens was dying of cancer and I read something about him and um, where he said that he felt that like being consumed by this cancer, he felt very sorry for any women that would go through the same illness as him because he felt that he was, he was pregnant with a hostile entity and that there was something about like almost maternal about like gestating this thing that is like consuming and destroying you. And that, Mm haunts me <laughs> like, yes. as, 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 as an image of kind of like you know of just the, the idea of something within that is also like destructive and is also like feeding off you mm-hmm. i mean i'm sure people that have you know not just a cancer but like par- people who've had horrific ha- parasites and stuff maybe like would be getting something else from this film but yeah the idea of like nourishing something that is killing you from the inside out is mm-hmm. just like truly one of the most upsetting things that this like taps into it is and i think the best alien horrors have that because i think the the, one of the things we've talked about quite a lot this series is that the the problem sometimes with sort of sci-fi horror is that it could be a bit too glossy it can be a bit too shiny Mm -hmm. and that can kind of you need something visceral you need something you can you know relate to i suppose in a visceral way and that's I, i think why there's the xenomorph in alien right is so perfect because it's sort of familiar as well as being alien and it has that 
horrible kind of invasion of your body kind of side to it as well, which I think taps into something in all of us, doesn't it? You know, I mean, the kind of real moment of body horror that I'm sure you were about to get onto, but where they cut open the man's chest and his intestines <sighs> are kind of wriggling about like vines. I think it was interesting that I had no moment of flinching at the, when they were actually carving into this man's torso. Yes. But I could feel every squirm <laughs> of those kind of vine-like intestines that is, you know, darting around inside of him, which is odd because like, what what's more likely to happen to me? <laughs> but I was just like, yeah, no, that one. That one. The, <laughs> the moving intestines is so horrible. It, again, there's something really gross and uncanny about it and you're right it's it's not so much the cutting but also what's happening here right like why is oscar isaac's character slicing his mate open have they like is he have they all lost their minds do you think layla like has this shimmer actually affected them all psychologically and turned them all into killers and that kind of thing just i don't know i i don't know whether like losing their minds seems like a bit too like simple as like an explanation it's almost like they're just oh god how, how even to put it like they are sort of at one with the universe almost in a in, in a weird way and they are like at one with the systems around them they are kind of they seem more connected to one another they seem to understand each other without being able to say much to one another they connect mm. to like plant matter and everything in this way and they'd be able to kind of i don't know let go of like these kind of flesh suits that we all yes. like yeah they're sort of transcending in. almost beyond it in some way yeah which again sorry i know like i'm using my philosophy degree way too much at the moment but like it, it does remind me of like there is a lot of idea in philosophy about like all of this is artifice like all of this is like you know the the idea of like the ghosts in the machine and that like we're actually just kind of weighed down by society and what we think that we should do when we adopt all of these behaviors and stuff and there's like a pure you right in the center of this and like Mm -hmm. the sort of human shell is like nothing and i feel like that's almost more what they're moving towards they're moving to just being like separate from all the the sort of body that they inherited was before something like they become almost like abstract beings yeah there's almost shades of something like a uh, hellraiser but also this is something mm. we've seen in films like event horizon and from beyond it's lovecraftian right again but that idea of yeah you yeah. know you've gone beyond you've seen something beyond your comprehension and these people start literally mutilating themselves and cutting off their own limbs and skin and this kind of stuff and it's almost like your your yeah, your perception or something or your ideas suddenly or yourself has grown too big for your skin sack that you're in Mm. in some way. Like you've transcended, you've gone beyond just human capability in some way. Um, And yeah, yeah, and it's like interesting that Tessa Thompson's character at one point says that like, oh, you're going to fight it. And then she just allows herself to just entirely like succumb to it. Like, no, I'm just going to exist as part of almost like a... I don't want to say a hive mind because it's not quite that, but it's almost like I'm just going to become part of this kind of almost more communal existence. Yeah, Yeah, that's absolutely, yeah, this big old organism. Um, So, I mean, another... We've got to talk about one of the scariest moments in this film. One of the scariest moments in uh, in a film I've seen in a very long time, which is the the bear, right? And this comes a bit later on in the film. First of all, we see this bear creature attack, don't we? And drag mm. uh, poor the character of Shepard just off into the woods. Um, but we don't get a sort of good glimpse of it. And then later, these characters, this is the part when the characters have all started to turn on each other. Obviously, I think Gina Rodriguez's character has tied the other three up to chairs they're all starting to sort of slightly lose it at this point. And then they hear what they think are the screams of, of of their friend outside, right? And it actually turns out to be this bear creature that can sort of mimic human voices and is also this kind of really monstrous sort of... It's like a mix of about four different creatures, I think, including human, isn't it? Um, I absolutely love this moment. What do you think of this scene, Layla? Well, like full disclosure, I have a paralyzing fear of bears. Oh, I can watch wow. the most grotesque Cronenbergian horror, but if you watch White Fang at a certain age, like the nothing scares me more than bears. Yeah. 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 Um, so 
yes, it haunts my nightmares. <laughs> like, uh, actually, I did have a moment when you when I was settling down to watch this where I was like, just, you know, pull yourself together, Latif. The bear <laughs> isn't on it for that long. You can get you through can this. this. But yes, I love this idea. Because I didn't know what you read it as. Mm. But for me, it felt like this bear was taking on the traits of everything it ate. Yeah, yeah. So it kind of like seems to have adopted a bit of like a goat or deer-like yes. creature. It has some of the movements of that. And then after it eats um, Cass, mm -hmm. like it gets these human-like elements, not just from the way that it speaks, but at one point you see it front on and it's got like one very human eye in an eye socket. Oh. <laughs> think that like Cass is also sort of in there like making decisions as the bear I did not get that actually no I just assumed Cass is dead and gone and it's just found a way in that sort of because I think there's a little bit of it's the shape of its face as well and mouth that looks a bit hyena like and it mm -hmm. almost reminds me of that thing people say about hyenas where they can sort of mimic other animal noises or screams or something can't they um, and I wondered if it was just that if it was just it was just mimicking the sound of her screaming as it was eating her basically maybe this is just me trying to comfort myself with the bear I felt that the bear because Cass is in there saves them mm -hmm. and like at this point you've got Gina Rodriguez's character who's got them tied up to chairs and is going to, you know, probably do something not great. Yes. <laughs> yes. And and that's the only member, that's who that she goes for. And it almost feels like Cass is just one of many sentient things within this yeah. to me, but has enough power to at least direct the sort of apex predator anger at the right person and save them that's really interesting and th that might be the case because it, it obviously savagely attacks gina rodriguez's character immediately and mm. really tears her apart i mean literally rips her jaw off it's absolutely it's the stuff of nightmares this whole set piece but it doesn't it it sort of creeps around the others like it can't see and i was thinking is it blind maybe because it's sort of it gets right up close to them and they kind of keep still and silent and it sort of creeps mm -hmm. around them doesn't it um but also there might be something else more to it, like you said. Maybe it's being partly controlled or partly influenced by one of the many things it's consumed and absorbed or something. Um, it is just, for me, one of the coolest monster designs because, again, there's that feeling that it looks recognisable enough to feel like many different animals and creatures, but also it's alien enough to be like, I've never seen or heard anything like this. I mean, it's the noises that it makes as mm. well, right? That is just, oh, God. just horrific. Upsetting. So <laughs> upsetting. <laughs> so upsetting. And these things don't easily die, right? The, the bear and the alligator, they take like multiple shots from shotguns, don't they, in order to actually yeah. finally die? Yeah, no, they machine, like machine they're emptying full machine guns yeah. into them. Yeah. And you've got to assume she's been in the army, she's a good shot. This isn't like some sort of, mm -hmm. you know, chaotic thing but also like the bear doesn't seem that con concerned with eating no um, w uh, what you called Anya do you know Anya yeah. yeah yeah um so and and there is this sense that like sort of the normal rules of nature don't necessarily apply like they talk about like they don't ever remember needing to eat anything within this and mm -hmm. like the animals even when they attack them it's not necessarily from a place of like that they want to consume them mm -hmm. so it's which i suppose makes it all the more kind of cosmic horror yeah. horrifying because it's just like this is not playing by the normal rules of you know i'm hungry therefore i eat you not that i thought that was ever bear's motivation to begin with i just think they're horrible horrible animals <laughs> just... and we have been fooled by winnie the pooh <laughs> and all of these things into thinking they're cute and they're not they're monsters yeah it's like Grizzly Man, right? That really, that haunted me. Um, how did you find The Revenant? That must have been a tough one for you. It was tough. Yeah. I'm not gonna... <laughs> Thank uh, you for yeah. your concern. Yeah, good. Um, yeah, there, and, and, and at this point, I mean, we really are in a sort of body count format by this point as well. Like, again, going back to mm. Predator, that idea that 
five go in and only one comes out right and we know that from the start basically so we are now watching each of these characters get picked off by different monsters at this point because you get characters that are killed by these beasts but then what is this weird thing that happens to tessa thompson's character she sort of like you say just sort of wanders off into the woods and becomes a tree person basically and it's like wow and that's just it for her yeah i mean she sort of just I suppose in a way she gives up and in a way that sort of, to me, seemed like symptomatic of like a larger depression within that character Mm -hmm. that she alludes to. But it's not particularly a suicide. It's like an inertia on her part where she's saying to like basically that Jennifer Jason Lee's character is going to go with it and Natalie Portman's character is going to fight it and I am going to do neither. (laughs) And like, I kind of, that is not something that you normally get in a horror film because it's like just a full giving up. (laughs) Yeah, you're right. And I guess it goes, there is is a line about that even, isn't there? Jennifer Jason Lee sort of says, look, not many of us actually commit suicide, but so many of us self-destruct and sort of... yeah indicates that there is that slight difference right as well which i guess is is sort of portrayed here um yeah no like moment of glory and it feels like i love that moment and i feel like it feels quite profound and almost like coming from like maybe like an eastern tradition of like life of just like i'm just gonna become one yes. with everything else and like not choose this like binary of life or death like yeah. i'm just going to exist yeah return to the earth almost right yeah um yeah i really i really liked it it's really striking imagery and then of course and and and, th- and again this is the kind of interesting thing you've got these kind of very physical deaths you've got this kind of biological mm-hmm. death and then you've got this kind of cosmic moment at the end right J- jennifer jason lee they reach the lighthouse finally jennifer jason lee's character bursts into cosmic light and and, yeah. <laughs> that, and that's that's what we'll say um and uh and then of course this is where natalie portman stares into the abyss into the shimmering abyss um and uh meets her kind of alien double and this whole kind of very strange sort of physical set piece that plays out from this point onwards what do you think of this strange moment in the lighthouse i just felt like it was so and yeah. which is what I loved so much about it. And like just the fact that we'd sort of been building up and sort of layering ideas and imagery mm. and kind of concept that when kind of truly something that is completely out of the box happens, it doesn't feel like a huge, like out of nowhere tonal shift. I kind of completely bought into it. Yeah. And I did discover that it is the same dancer that does the dance scene in Ex Machina. That's right. It is, yeah. But yeah. um I just thought it was absolutely extraordinary. Like I didn't know that like Natalie Portman had that level of sort of unbridled performance in her of like going completely abstract and just going into mm. movement and stuff. And it's so interesting how you can have like this almost mirroring of people mm-hmm. where like the like they're for much of it, they're doing their identical movements, but it's more that they're kind of mirroring the emotions within their movements. Yes, yes. And yeah, I abso- I, I, I've watched it so many times and each time um, I learn nothing new. <laughs> I, <laughs> yeah. I'm just as confused about like, what is this supposed to mean? But like, I don't want to say vibes because it just, uh, that feels like a little bit like diminishing of it, but it's just something that kind of can like wash over you thematically yes. and feels a bit like a microcosm of the like entire film. love it so much it's hypnotic isn't it and the music it's strange music choices that he makes as well i love the score in this moment as well of course it really i mean in a really obvious way it really reminds me of under the skin as well right jonathan glazer's yeah. under the skin there's something so visually uh that kind of reminds me of that but um but i love it because again you're, you're kind of 
is this some sort of beautiful moment where she's meeting this person and they're sort of merging and or is it actually this sort of monster attack and it's yeah it's a really fascinating scene for so many reasons yeah um, and it's scary and it's melancholy yeah and it's kind of ultimately triumphant but messy and it's like no easy answers with, with this and at it's, all and it's sort of a it's sort of an ending it's sort of a happy ending sort of not because it's kind of like well she destroys the shimmer right she actually blows up that lighthouse and then the shimmer disappears so possibly humanity is saved but then of course it it's revealed that she and Oscar Isaac are both these alien sort of doppelgangers right at the end of the film so what what does that mean what does that mean for the future of the human race I wonder at this point I don't know because I don't know that this has any motive beyond wanting to exist but I just think that it's lovely I mean it just made me think of like that they've essentially separately endured like basically identical traumas they've been through the same thing apart from one another and where there was this sort of distance between them they seem closer than ever at the end and they say like i'm not not me you know he says like i i I don't think i'm kane anymore or something to that effect but it's like they're not not each other at all this isn't like a kind of strange faceless alien being greeting itself like there is a there is the person there is some degree of the person that was there before it's not, I don't think, like a full imposter, but they are complete, but they are forever transformed. Yeah, it's not like a pod person invasion of the body snatchers thing so much, is it? Like mm. there is a part of them there with some of their own memories and, and yeah, um, but also they seem sort of blank at the same time. There's something really interesting about it and it's going to be one of those things where I'm going to, I'm going to want to keep watching it over and over and try and sort of get my head around it. And I probably oh, never good luck. will. Yeah. I, no, I mean, I've, I've been there quite a few times and like, I've gotten absolutely no closer. There was one point where I was watching it and I was like thinking that like, I've, I've got a very, very sweet, beautiful daughter who's five and my daughter looks just like me, but better. She just like, if you look at all of my childhood photos, it's me, but with like an Instagram filter on it. And I was looking at this and it's like, oh, is this just like something about like this really like fucked up thing of like motherhood where you like replicate yourself and then you don't, because you love this person, you don't realize how freaking eerie that is yes. <laughs> like, oh. to have this other like extension of you that's kind of taken your dna and is now interacting with the world with sort of freedom and choices but they have your face <laughs> like, and then i watched it again i was like no i don't think that's it <laughs> well it's so, and this is what's so clever about it because you know cosmic horror as a concept is quite amorphous and strange and 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 in so many ways it you know it's such it's such a big theme and such a big idea but i think this film makes it also feel human at the same time that there's enough of it mm. that feels real and human and relatable and visceral and um yeah that's why it works so well i think yeah it feels like there's nothing like there's nothing in this film there's not like a moment on screen that isn't like thematically relevant yeah like definitely. every frame every like choice is very like specifically bringing us back to one central idea. Even if we're not 100% what the idea is, it just seems like everything is imbued with like meaning. That is so true. And I guess that's the one, you know, that's the one criticism in some way I could level against it is that that it, it, you, you don't ever feel like you're watching characters be characters just for characters' sake. Like every line no. of dialogue, like you say, it's like characters spend most of the film talking to each other about the themes of the film right and i guess Mm -hmm. that is something about it that maybe adds slightly to that feeling of coldness that it has but it's it's all deliberate i think yeah i find like i found that more annoying in um with alex garland's dialogue in sunshine for some reason in this i think it was out there enough where it's just like well i'm not watching Mm -hmm. what is supposed to be human interaction yes like on some level like i'm I'm watching something like more experimental so i kind of don't mind if it doesn't feel that human yeah 
But yeah, like Sunshine, I just found it a bit annoying. I was like, this isn't how people speak. You're trying to have your cake and eat it too. Yeah, he's definitely got that element to all of his films and either it'll work for you if it, or it doesn't. Like I think Ex Machina is that too, right? There's a lot of Donald Gleeson and Oscar Isaac talking to each other about what it means to be human, blah, 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 blah. And, mm. uh, you know, and, and it's the same in his TV show Devs as well. And I, I totally understand that criticism of his stuff being a bit too cold and a bit too ideas over emotion being thrown into it. But for me, this movie did did kind of emotionally get me as well at the same time. It sort of it ticks all the boxes for me, this one. Um, and this was, of course, like... Uh, I mean, sadly, we'll probably never see any more films from this book series because the book, uh, the Jeff Vandermeer book, was part of a trilogy, the Southern Reach trilogy, Annihilation, followed by Authority, and then Acceptance. Um, mm-hmm. But I think because of everything that happened with the film and it getting shoved on Netflix, I, I'm, I, I think that it's never going to happen now. We're never going to see an Authority or an Acceptance, but... Hey ho! I do think you know. I wouldn't have known that. I'm I don't good know with how, that. No, yeah, I, I wouldn't. Have, <laughs> I wouldn't have known to be honest that it doesn't feel like it's a film that is part one of a trilogy. You know, like yeah. like we don't have an ending. I feel like we do have an ending. It's just a very particular ending. <laughs> yeah, and I look. I mean, I'm all for ambiguity in endings, and I think purposeful ambiguity is a wonderful thing. And I get deeply annoyed when people are just like, "No, but what really happened at the end of the Sopranos?" And it's just like, "No, the point is you." Like, he's purposefully not telling you. There's yes. not, like, some secret, like, code. And, like, that's life. <laughs> like, also, and that's ideas that you don't necessarily get a neat bow at the end of things saying that, like, this is exactly what's going on and this is exactly what Oscar Isaac and Natalie Portman will be doing onto the future and this is their plan. Like, yeah. we're fundamentally to- told at the beginning of this film that, like, this thing we don't know what it wants and we don't know if it can want yes. like this is existing some on on, on in, a, in a way that is inhuman to us and we won't be able to grasp it we can only grasp like how that would feel to be in that situation i suppose yeah god it's fascinating stuff it's fascinating stuff um now we are going to wrap up on annihilation very shortly but first of all let's head on over to this week's wild about horror segment because of course with a film like this freudian cinephile mary wild has plenty of thoughts on alex garland's annihilation Hey Mike, Mary Wild here, back for my final Wild About Horror segment in the Alien series. So what do you get when you mix Predator and Event Horizon in the coolest, edgiest way possible? You get Alex Garland's stunning sci-fi psychological horror film, Annihilation, of course. The story follows a group of explorers who enter the Shimmer a mysterious quarantine zone of plants and animals mutated by an alien presence. The Shimmer is a terrain that presents us with polymorphous impulses experienced by the ego as a mortal threat, something foreclosed that re-emerges as a wild, destructive urge. What returns is, paradoxically, life itself, but in a mutated form. The fact that the conscious personality perceives this as dangerous precisely confirms the ego's repressive nature. The central theme of Annihilation appears to be self-destruction, which is captured in these lines by Dr. Ventress. Quote, As a psychologist, I think you're confusing suicide with self-destruction. They're very different. Almost none of us commit suicide, whereas almost all of us self-destruct, somehow, in some part of our lives. We drink or take drugs or destabilize the happy job or happy marriage. But these aren't decisions, they're impulses. A biologist is better placed to explain them than me. Isn't self-destruction coded into us, imprinted into each cell? End quote. In psychoanalysis, the death drive is understood as the tendency toward destruction, expressed by behaviors such as aggression and compulsively repeating negative life patterns. Sigmund Freud initially believed that the urge to obtain pleasure was curtailed by an interfering ego. He later theorized that it is rather our masochistic need to annihilate what we love 
via fear of commitment, denial, and recreating traumatic life events that prevents us from being happy. This is manifested in the struggle between two opposing drives, eros, the seat of creativity, harmony, sexual connection, reproduction, self-preservation, and thanatos, the domain of self-destructiveness, repetition, and aggression. Freud also speculated about the biological basis for repetition compulsion, claiming that it is on an equal footing with an urge to restore an earlier state of things. Ultimately, this is the desire to return to the original inorganic condition, the desire to die. All the characters in Annihilation are affected by the Freudian death drive. Paramedic Anya is a recovering addict, managing the impulse to rely on substances. Physicist Josie's self-harm compulsion is more direct. She used to cut her arms and now wears long sleeves to cover up the numerous scars. Geomorphologist Cass mourns two deaths, her daughter passing away from illness and the demise of the woman she used to be before the tragic loss of her child. In Lena's case, the death drive plays out as the pursuit of something possibly egregious, an affair, even at the risk of destroying her marriage. Infidelity is a common example of engaging in thrill-seeking, risky, life-ruining acts. But might it be more reckless of Lena to stay with her husband, Cain, when her heart is really with her lover, Dan? Here, the destructive element implies that life itself rebels against the ego. The true representative of death is the ego itself, a petrification that interrupts the natural flow of life. Against this background, we can interpret the shimmer in Alex Garland's film as a force that compels people to do away with ego identifications. Social masks collapse. Organisms interact in an authentic way with each other, showing their true feelings, even if that amounts to violent outbursts or total surrender to the destructive aura. Freud perceived a clinical manifestation of the death instinct in the phenomenon of masochism, and suggested that the tendency to inflict self-injury might be a reliable indication of the death drive. With the libido and life force set out on the flip side of the repetition compulsion equation, Freud paints a picture of two belligerent forces in the mind, eros and thanatos, locked in eternal battle. Returning for a moment to the speculative biology angle in psychoanalysis, the idea is that creating living cells binds energy and creates an imbalance. Freud interprets the destructive tendency of cells to indicate a natural inclination to return to an earlier state of non-existence. He claims that this death drive was the first instinct developed by organic life. Destruction of the self is a resolution of tensions produced by external stimuli. This is especially true in the case of Dr. Ventress, who has terminal cancer and is determined to learn the truth behind the shimmer before she dies. She exhibits an almost morbid desire to connect with the destructive alien energy, but the pressure of returning to an original state of things gives her cells their living quality. Her mission seems to animate her and spring her into action. Applying Freud's theory to this scenario, molecular diffusion is akin to a death wish, the compulsion of matter in cells to return to an inanimate format extends to the whole living organism. The psychological death wish is therefore a manifestation of an underlying physical compulsion present in every cell. Alex Garland's Annihilation illustrates this point masterfully, which is a courageous feat of filmmaking because such a direct confrontation with the impulse to self-destruct is taboo in our society. Our values are constructed around elevating life above everything. To suggest that we might be on some level preoccupied with death or engaging in self-sabotage runs the risk of being perceived very negatively, leading us to feel alienated from others. A film like this, which rejects the well-intentioned call to choose life in the popular discourse, sets out the proposition that there is a cultural merit in coming to terms with the death drive as it helps us to identify, comprehend, and integrate harmful impulses in a functional, sublimated way. Thank you, Evolution of Horror listeners, for your kind responses to my segments. And as ever, thank you, Mike, 
for including me in this amazing podcast family. Until next time. A big thank you to the wonderful Mary Wilde. I cannot believe that was Mary's final segment in our Alien series already. Uh, Mary, thank you so much as ever. It's been such a joy to work with you. And of course, Mary will be back uh, again on the podcast at some point soon. But until then, if you want to hear more from Mary, more of her Freudian takes on cinema, then you can follow her on Twitter at Psychstar or you can sign up to her Patreon, patreon.com slash Mary Wild. Okay, Leila, my final question for you about Annihilation is, you know, I guess how does it hold up? Would you still recommend this film and does it still hold up on rewatch for you? I think it does. I think, I, you know, it's one of those things where I, the more I, I kind of return to it, the more special I actually feel like it is. Unlike yeah. how it's not the sort of thing that gets made very often and it's not the sort of... yeah. You know, even just talking about the color of it mm-hmm. and like the kind of uncompromising singular vision to it. I mean, that's always what I really dig. Um, perfect. Well, there you go. Um, well, Layla, thank you so much for 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 dropping by to discuss this incredibly confusing film. Um, Yay! I, I much that's what we want. We want to think more, not less. <laughs> exactly. I love it. Um, and just remind us where people can find you and more of your work out there online. Uh, okay. Um, I'm on Twitter at Layla underscore Latif, and then I pop up a lot on Little White. Sight and Sound, Total Film, BBC Culture, AV Club. I'm everywhere. You're everywhere. I'm everywhere. I'm everywhere. I'm everywhere. Like the everywhere shimmer. <laughs> 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 just like slowly corrupting all of these places from the inside out and making them unrecognizable from the thing that you once loved. <laughs> exactly. That's what we love. <laughs> Layla, thank you so much. And that's it for this week. Thank you so much for listening. And a huge thank you to my two fantastic guests, Louise Blaine and Layla Latif. God, that was a heavy going double bill, but I absolutely love both these films. Uh, I would love to hear your thoughts. What do you think of them? Please do get in touch. You can email me, evolutionofhorror at gmail.com. You can also find me on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and Letterboxd. And if you want to discuss this week's episode with fellow listeners, then you can join the discussion group. That's the Evolution of horror discussion group and that can be found on facebook you can find all previous seasons and episodes of this podcast on our website evolutionofhorror.com you can find this podcast in all the usual podcast places and if you get a spare moment we would be really grateful if you could drop us a little rating and review on apple podcasts which really helps us get discovered by new listeners so on to next week then and we've got another brilliant uh, double bill of recent alien movies from the last 20 years next week i'm going to be joined by two different guests to discuss two really fun really interesting alien movies that also deal with some really interesting themes of class and race and provide some really interesting social commentary so next week i'm going to be joined in the first half of the episode by rihanna dylan to discuss neil blomkamp's district nine and in the second half i'll be joined by Lou Thomas to discuss Joe Cornish's Attack the Block. Cannot wait. Join us next week for all of this and more on the evolution of horror.